figure out what your actual best posture is. It may be on the ground, it may be kneeling, it may be cross-legged, it may be sitting in a chair, it may be standing up, but don't hold yourself to a supposed to. In here, you don't have to, you just find you. What's, what's actually good? What has a high chance of success? Now adjust your legs so that they're comfortable, stable, and they feel safe. And then you can forget about your legs. Just let them be legs. Feel the balloon at the crown of your head, that helium balloon. It's pulling your whole body gently up and then you're anchored at the ground. And gently sway forward and back and then by feel or like a pendulum, just come to rest at, this feels like the right spot. And it's not rigid, it's gently swaying, like microscopically. It's very light, easily changeable. And now we do the same thing, rock left and right, big rocking motion. Then just like that balloon, just come to rest at what feels like the right spot. Not rigid, easily changeable. On the next inhale, squeeze the hands into fists. On the exhale, it's totally soft. We're remembering what it feels like to release. That feels nice. Now put the hands how you like them. On the next inhale, we're going to tighten up the shoulders. Sigh, let them fall. That feels nice to do that. Let them be where they are. <clears throat> next inhale, tighten up the back of the neck. Sigh, drop the chin. Find the natural spot for your neck, what feels nice. In service of this posture. With a big yawn. Relax the jaw muscles, don't let the teeth quite touch. Relax the tongue. And finally, lift the eyebrows up, scrunch the forehead, and then drop the whole face like a curtain. And let that feeling go down through your whole body, all the way to the ground. And congratulations, you've just arrived in the one yoga posture we're going to practice for the next 24 minutes. So just feel it whenever you need to adjust it. Adjust it. And mainly, whenever you don't need to adjust it, just settle. Just like that snow globe that has been shaken up and now we set it on a shelf, just let it like silt in water, let it just slowly descend and find its place naturally. The mind's allowed to do whatever it wants while we experience this posture. Whenever there's contraction notice, we just rest back, settle, Contraction is noticed, oh, rest back, settle. Anything else that pulls the attention, 
drop it and look for the contraction. And you'll get to a place where without trying to notice anything, you kind of know everything. Stuff like you just kind of know what's happening. And just release any tension that stops this integration from happening. Let the whole body be so changeable. It's like your whole body is made of silt in water, and even the slightest thing touching it would disperse it. It would change the shape of it. And let your body adjust like that very freely, tiny, tiny adjustments anytime it needs to, without thinking about it first. Settling letting adjustments happen, settling, letting adjustments happen. Contraction is just friction in that system that's trying to stop the changeability from happening. So just release the e-brake, release the contraction. <clears throat> Let's just see what happens.
I guess um, I'm having a couple like big emotional upwelling moments, and they seem, <laughs> and I'm quite quite enjoying them in terms of like they feel like insights. They feel like I'm like, oh, that's what's been going on, mm -hmm. you know. And then pretty much every time, then you say something, <laughs> and then I'm like, it's gone. <laughs> You're like, if you get distracted, do something or other. <laughs> and I don't know if I'm supposed to grab it or if it was just supposed to, it was just done naturally or what. But that's happened a couple times this morning. And the other thing is like I kind of I'm going into into like dreamy dreamscape and I kind of come out of dreamscape and kind of go back into it and then come back out. It's it's very relaxed. Yeah. Do you realize you come out of the dreamscape? Yeah. Okay, then yeah. it's making realizing happen. It's like, a, it's like sometimes the, the dream's happening and I'm still kind of like with my body as it's going. Yeah. That's the root skill that is very hard to teach, but it will you'll develop that naturally where you'll start to see thoughts or see a dream or see a daydream, but you're still experiencing your body and it doesn't have you. That's a whole different way you can operate. And I can't tell someone to do that or else they will be so pissed off that they can't do it. <laughs> but I can trick you into having it happen. <laughs> so that's one, just let it. Two, you have to start to build faith in you, your true being. That whatever it is that makes you feel emotions and makes you make decisions and want what you want and all that, like it's not always smart. But in the bigger picture, everything you know is because of that. Your whole being is because of that. So you have to start trusting that if it will bring that up mm -hmm. when the time's right, that you don't have to make it bring it up. Mm. You just have to give it stage time. Mm. And if it's right, it will bring it up. And if it's not right, it won't. And you may not know it's not right, but it knows. Mm. So keep making the time. And then if, you, if you're at a place where you get entangled by, it was just bringing it up, and now it's gone again. Go home tonight and make a nice, like, dust an area off, light some candles or something, make it cool, make it feel sacred or, like, healthy, and then do some work. Like, just lay down and relax like that for an hour and then get up, move around, do it again, and do as much as you need to feel like, if Jason doesn't keep messing, it's this thing is pretty cool, right? So if you can do that, do that. And you will eventually realize part of its nature, the capacity it unlocks in us is unstirability, which is that even while it's coming up, it can't actually be stopped by stuff. Mm. But that when we think it should be stopped by stuff, it will, mm. because it's shy. So whenever it thinks something else that needs to talk it just like goes mm. it, it gets quiet but if it doesn't think it has to stop it will just roll so mm. one is to realize it will keep rolling two is to realize it knows when to bring things up and uh what it is i don't know if i'm going to really define that for you throughout this i'll i'll just say it's natural it's part of your being it's wise uh it's the thing that uh, if you start thinking about something, it's how you were walking. It's the thing that catches your balance when you trip. Uh, and it's not a conscious thing. You don't consciously control it. You can try to, but you're really bad at it compared to what it knows how to do. So all of us are. So it's really good when we stop trying to be the horse we're riding and we let the horse mm -hmm. be the horse. And even better if we get off the horse and let it just be a horse, like just let it. So the horse is bringing up stuff because mm -hmm. it thinks maybe this is good. And it's maybe running experiments to see if it's good. So you just let it figure it out. And if you feel like it's pushing, like I'm not ready for this in this environment, or you can just kind of know, please don't. And it will learn from that mm -hmm. and it'll try it at a different time, but it will do it. And it's important for us to realize we don't make that happen we can add our two cents. So you can invite it. If it's not doing it, you can actually ask in your mind, would you like to? You can bring up that memory and say, do you want to run with this? Mm -hmm. Like that. And then see, sometimes it'll just start coming up. And if it doesn't, don't force it. It means it knows something you don't, mm -hmm. why it's not. And just 
Okay, then I'm just gonna practice the root skill, which is let go. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Rest back. And then when you get caught, release tension. And releasing tension is resting back. So release tension. When you get caught, release tension. When you get caught, release tension. You can just do that. And then if you can smile sometimes that like, hey, I managed to do this, that's still it. But it doesn't fit that perfect RRSR template. And guess what? Life doesn't happen in a template. So RRSR is a lie. Every sutra is a lie. Every method is a lie. They are teaching you, they're pointing at the truth, but the truth is the truth. And so you have my permission, follow your intuition, see if what you want to do is better. If it's not better, go back to this. If it's okay. better, try it your way. But it also, if you're waiting and it feels like it's an effort, it's not the waiting that's the problem. It's there's contraction about waiting. Yeah. In Buddhism, they often talk about the trickster Mara, right? And Mara sounds like, well, that's some BS, you know, supernatural thing. That's not real. But what if we just said, like, whatever is happening here, whether the thoughts are mine or Mara's or whatever, your mind will literally, you're like, we're relaxing and getting rid of the I. And then the eye will stand up and put its arm over your shoulder and say, yeah, we are getting rid of the eye, right? Like, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> and then when you look over, you'll say, there it is. And then it will like pop up right here and say, yeah, let's get that guy like that. And it does this thing like that, right? So the, the thing is to realize anytime you hold a view, you're usually, it has its arm around you and, and you don't see it. It's hiding in the shadows. So you have to hold no certainty you just look around, is there contraction? It's made of contraction. That's it. And if you can't find any contraction, are you sure? Maybe there isn't, and that's okay. But it, check, am I sure? Look around. And then if not, you may have just been experiencing peace and you weren't even able to appreciate it because you're like, well, where's the contraction in here? So. Mm. I'm so used to practicing now with sort of being aware of awareness and, and like sinking into that sort of like Maha Mudra style that I noticed that when I'm sitting today, that just happens, like that's happening automatically. And it doesn't feel like there's much contraction there, but then I'm remembering, oh, like there's a subtle effort. So like relax. And when I feel like I fully sink into sort of this, it gets a little bit of dullness for me rather than that sort of like pristine kind of, oh, I'm aware of what's aware. Yeah. And I mean, it's also partially because I'm tired. I haven't been sleeping great lately, but yeah, I'm wondering like if I should still be letting that kind of happen or actually just let that go to let that practice, which is now sort of like automatic, let it go. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if you were practicing at home, it would be a different answer than this weekend. We have a chance to do it again and again and again. So you kind of get to like, do some deeper troubleshooting. When you get to do it a lot, you should go through that. You should just say, okay, I'm gonna be aware of dullness and then look for contraction or not while dullness happens. Because really it's just aware of blank and blank is your life. Mm -hmm. So be aware of what it's like when you're sleepy and what, when you're not, you'll appreciate when you're not. And okay. when you're caught up and when you're not, you'll be appreciative when you're not. You'll notice, you'll, you'll realize how cool it is when conditions line up and the sun comes out, you know, like, oh yeah, it's been cloudy for a while. Uh, but if you're at home, I would say change your conditions, like change your posture so that you have to be more alert. Maybe stand up on your toes a little bit so that you have to keep your balance or like stand, get on your knees on a hard floor so it kind of hurts a little bit. And then when you, when you get unhappy enough about that, you won't be sleepy. It'll be very clear. I don't like this D thing. And then you can go, okay, I'll change it. But you'll be very clear again. Because uh, a lot of times if we're angry, anger is very interesting. And you are very clear about what it feels like. It's like crystal clear. I do not freaking like this, whatever it is. That's a real good way to get that. Then you just rel release whatever is making that happen. And then you are very interested, right? 
Uh, but here, your system knows how to balance it out. That's the real answer. And if you just go through it, you have my permission for it to be dreamy. You have my permission to fall asleep. You have my permission to be gone the entire session. And this is when you realize, oh, I was gone. That's OK. And then see if that actually happens. Your uh, Buddha nature, or whatever you want to call it, the Tao, or your true nature, or your intuitive deep mind, or whatever, it's going to draw from whatever it knows. And it's going to run experiments. It's shy. So you're making space for it to kind of try things. And when it tries it, it's going to learn from it, as long as you're not distracted from it. So you just let it, if inquiry wants to come up, let it say, who's doing this? Who's asking this inquiry? Whatever. And don't mess with it. Just watch how the process goes. And it will figure out if it wants to do that or not. And it will figure out why. And that, that's what I mean is that this is old. It's basically old Chan, old Zen from like the first thousand years of it. And uh, it's, I would call it a tantric practice. And by that, what I mean is that we learn through union. So you don't learn from me. I'm telling you how to touch this thing. You learn from this thing that you touch. And it's going to, you watch it. You watch it figure out what you should do, and you'll learn what to do. You watch it deal with sleepiness, and you'll learn different ways to deal with sleepiness. And it will do trial and error. So it's, it doesn't know everything already, but you're telling it, it's time for you. you. You figure this out. You learn. And just watch. It learns on its own, too. Everything, all it, it uses your senses. So if your senses are constantly in Maui thinking about something, mm -hmm. that's all it's going to learn about. But if you can learn about now, what now sounds like, what now feels like, what now thinks about, well, it feels like that, what now smells like, what now tastes like, all that, it will take all that and it knows how to work with that in a way that your conscious mind is like a kindergartner compared to. So. That I find there to be this step, it's like our, our, like smile or it's like after the relax i'm evaluating uh the relax mm. and that creates itself some sort of tension yeah so, so i guess i'm curious if you have an opinion on that and i guess like even maybe and this is related but by the end of the third sit i was definitely feeling like ready to be done uh like feeling kind of just like oh, I can't wait for that bell to hit. And I don't know if you have thoughts about how to handle that. Sure. One is, if you feel ready to be done, can you let go of contraction while you feel ready to be done? Because sometime in life, you might get in a car accident and be ready to be done dealing with it, and it still has to happen. Would you rather be tight and resisting it, or would you rather get into the Tao of handling it and being effective? Right. So part of it is learning. We don't just want to perform well when we're happy. We want to perform well with everything. Um, but the other thing is that evaluation step. Uh, everyone, close your eyes and then raise your hand if you get caught evaluating so that you aren't watching other people. Okay. So it's most people. That's pretty common. Okay. Um, just to. R, R, instead of smile, experience, R, R, E, R. Realize, try to relax, experience what that's like, rest. So there's no evaluation. Or if you want to get even further, take it out of R, S, R, and just when you realize there's tension, relax. And then when you realize there's tension, relax. No evaluation of how well it went. Only track. Just try to relax and then see what happens. You're learning. You're not doing it. You're learning how well it happens when you do it. So it's not, we're not looking at the output. We're, we're letting something that's not the micromanager handle the system. And that's really difficult for us sometimes until we learn to get hands off with it. So just see something and then wish, can this be let go? You can even just ask that question. How about this? And then that's it. You're done. 
It's not to make there be less. It's to notify whatever would make there be more or less that it can try to do something. It's its problem. And that's a little bit, one of my Chan teachers said this, is, he called it vacation mind. It's like if you take a vacation from work, but it started 10 minutes ago and your person who's covering for you is there and then you can't let them do it. You're like, no, 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 you got it, no. You have to go on vacation. Okay, so that thing is gonna not be used to it. Your, your driver is gonna be like, no, 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 it's gotta be this way. And so the root skill is to just, however you can, allow yourself to be on vacation as far as the outcome of this. The outcome doesn't matter. You're just running an experiment to see what happens. Maybe this thing is better than you at it. Maybe it's worse. You find out. That makes sense? It's a very common thing. I That was one of my biggest things for a long time. Same with when I would do breath meditation. I could not experience the breath without controlling it. I always wanted to like, well, it should be a little shorter, a little, oh, it'll be really good if it's like this. But I couldn't just like let it do its thing. It took me like eight years to do that. I mean, I was really bad at it. So this is similar, but it's hopefully more forgiving. Uh, I've been learning like nonviolent communication and kind of understanding the needs of people and yourself. So I, I I've been experimenting with kind of identifying the need of whatever thought pattern is coming up. And then it kind of, just by realizing it, it sort of dissipates. Like, oh, you're thinking about this because you need this. And then it goes away. Thank you. And I say, thank you. Is like self-talk ever a part of your meditation or is that a little bit like for letting the thought go, letting the pattern go? Have you ever, yeah, what are your thoughts on that, I guess? Yeah, it is something I teach. I teach it as self-inquiry. Okay. But you're, and it, I'm, there's nothing wrong with it, but you're stepping into a multi-dimensional rabbit hole there. Okay. Uh, which I wouldn't teach that in this period of time because there's a lot of untangling I need to do for people of how they think things work. Mm. And the short version of that story is if you are, making friends with or or pacifying thoughts and stuff, you're reifying that that thing is real. You're actually making it stronger. Now, if you can't help that, that's the right thing to do. Okay. But my path is to have that stuff evaporate until there is none of that. Like if, if you accidentally forget to make yourself, all of your problems will simultaneously disappear. <laughs> But it, and that's working with the Tao, that's working at Wuji or the Tao. But if you are in the 10,000 things, that's a different answer for every single thing. You will never finish them as fast as they pile up in your life. But sometimes that's where we are. And if you're there, it's better to do what you're doing than to just let them pile up and be miserable. Like, but it's really important to know that that's done as a stepping stone. Okay. Eventually to like fall out of that pool, like you're in a pool of piranhas and then you're like knocking them back. But you should eventually just get out of the water because you're going to get tired doing that, right? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That, that it's difficult to, do, to talk about that because modern society tends to lock in on one of those steps and think that that is life. But deeper spiritual practices realize that there are multiple steps you can be on. And what's true at one step is not true at the other. And the answer for one is not the truth of the other. And you need to be able to go up and down them. Okay. But if you try to make one of them everything, you'll find people don't share your experience sometimes. And what really bothers you, they're like, ah, that thing is no big deal. Or whatever. Uh, so that's kind of why that happens. But teaching that is now four times as much retreat, right? So it's like cover. It could be like this, or it could be like this. And this is the way this way. And this is the way that way. So okay. I'm not doing right. that this time, but I just want you to know that exists. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, how you could work with it, if you want to play with that, is whenever it shows up, instead of refining it, I want you to look at 
where did it come from and where does it go to? Okay. Every time, each time, there is no one answer. Where did it come? Okay. Where it's in your mind now, right? Or it's in your body. Yeah. It wasn't here an hour ago. Yeah. Where's the like trap door it came in? Where is that? Where's the emitter? Where's the movie projector? You have to find the projector. Don't watch the movie. You have to use the movie to look for the, there's a projector in here somewhere. Okay. And then it's landing on a screen. What is that? Actually feel it. You're assuming we all do. There's a screen there. That's me. Touch it. See if it's really there. You're feeling something. Where is it happening? Exactly. Where exactly? And you can do that by asking questions to it. You can ask, where are you coming from? And then look around. Look, where does this go? Or when it leaves, where did you go? Okay, and that will, it'll start to peel apart what seems like one thing, you'll kind of go into another dimension with it. And then you realize, whoa, like this isn't how I thought it was. I noticed that one of the harder piranhas to let go of is uh, a sort of judgment thought, and I would realize it and then judge myself for that thought. And sometimes a sound outside or you saying something would be like a total different realize of the sort of eddy that was happening. I was wondering if you've any thoughts on that or experience with the judgment of judgment yeah that's called uh that type of thing is called papancha and uh it means something like mental proliferation but our modern probably the modern way we can talk about it is it's trying to get rid of pop-up ads by clicking on pop-up ads so you click on and it punches you more and click that. you're like yeah, i'm gonna get to the end of these right it's that in fact, I bet you that thing is like a subconscious understanding of how our mind works, <laughs> how we develop that. Um, so the trick is, can you experience judgment releasing contraction? And don't worry about judgment because you'll realize, I'll ask you all right now, you don't have to answer me, look in you. Are you sure you know where your thoughts come from? Because if you make them, why do you make most of those? Why do you make judgment? Like, do you do, you do it on purpose? Do you invite it? Do you recall any time you've ever been like, come on, I wanna feel worse about this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we don't really realize maybe some of the emitters of thoughts are not on purpose, they're not mine. We know that kind of like, sort of in a nebulous way, but really look at that. Did I make that happen? And so if you haven't made it happen, how is it different than the weather? You don't make it be hot today. You just do something about what do you want to do in the heat? What do you want to do in judgment? Release tension. I don't want to be tight because that thing tells me to be tight. And then you'll see that radically shifts not only how you experience stuff, but also what actually happens. But you never really like get mad at the weather because it doesn't make sense. Just kind of be smart with the weather. If you're really in a judgment thing, don't do something during that time that requires you to not be in a judgment place. Just kind of be honest with yourself. And other people say, oh, I'm just not like, I'm kind of in a weird mood or something. And you'll, it's very like, it's being comfortable naked. You're kind of like, I can't fit into that swimsuit. The end, like you just don't, you don't like beat yourself up over it. It's like, that's not my thing right now. Does that make sense? Every phenomenon, wherever you end up, the mind is trying to get you to leave the contraction part, forget about that, so that the pop-up ads can start rolling. But the, they require that attachment point, the contraction. So all you have to do is, whenever you finally manage to, you sober up for a moment, oh, like that's a huge thing, a pop-up ad, just look around, where's the, oh, release that. And then let that be whatever it is, but it's not your business anymore. Let's talk about practice for a few minutes. Talk about swimming. So the 
there is no real target here, but whatever I present as a target is gonna be a moving target. Things are gonna evolve because I'm basically trying to get us to something that is, there is no word or words that are gonna encapsulate it very well, but you can feel it. It's very simple to experience. So what we're working towards is spending time being more in touch. And that's in touch with ourselves, in touch with other beings, in touch with everything. It's sort of a vivid experiencing, eventually all-inclusive vivid experiencing. So everything, being in touch with everything that we experience. Feeling and doing what is the best fit for all involved. So we have this all-inclusive experience. It's very vivid. We really experience it. And then from that, we have a natural response, which is what would be nice? What would be a nice fit here? Sometimes it's nothing. I'm just gonna hang out. Sometimes it's, oh, this person needs help, or maybe I, it would be useful if I did this. And this is uh, bodhicitta, the mind of awakening. And the mind of awakening is sort of interesting because we can develop it until we're so close to it that the real thing happens. And we can also touch the real thing until we realize what it is. And it's basically just how you would act if you were so content that you just didn't really need much. And after a while of that, you would be bored of trying, you don't need anything. So you just kind of start to be interested in what's happening around. And we try to do good stuff, whatever our talents are, whatever is a good fit in society with people around us. Uh, if we were to recognize a problem and we don't know how to handle it, we find maybe if we know someone, we direct them towards it. If it's something we're able to click into, then we naturally respond. So again, what we're working towards is spending time being more in touch, feeling and doing what is the best fit for all involved, finding our way into an intuitive, natural mode of being. And when there's not contraction present, we will find that this intuitive, natural mode of being is increasingly free of greed, hatred, or delusion or ignorance. Uh, it doesn't really need anything. It's just fine how it is. It's fine to just be. And then a way of working with that is studying together action, which is to look at everyone in our experience at every moment, everything in our experience at every moment without thinking about it, just take it in and then act in harmony with it. Uh, Miyamoto Musashi, he was a swordsman in Japan. He, there's a quote from the Book of Five Rings where he says, all things entail rise and fall timing. And any art, eventually, if it becomes the Tao of anything, it is to act in harmony with rise and fall timing. You plant plants and you trim them with rise and fall timing. When is it the right time? When is it not? You take a drink. When you're exercising with rise and fall timing, you take it at the wrong time, you inhale it down the wrong tube, you take it at the right time, it does what it should. You exercise the body with rise and fall timing. You rest when you're sick with rise and fall timing. The more we get in harmony with what's happening, the more things kind of just happen effortlessly and also effectively. So that's what we're kind of working here. Um, what this practice is not. It's not ignoring parts of our experience. It's not just doing whatever we want to do. It's not acting according to our preferences. That's not the same thing as intuition. Uh, but we can think that. So it's not our preference. It's what actually we feel and sense is like the right thing to do. And it may take some time to peel those apart. It's not putting ourselves at the center of things. Uh, I kind of jokingly refer to most of us as the main character. We think we're the main character in the movie or whatever, of life and everything. That food place is that far away from me and that price is expensive for me. And I like that thing and I don't like that thing. And that seems to be important. 
But this is the opposite. It's removing the main character. It's not making yourself under another main character. It's just no main character. Everything's the main character. And then there's a whole way to live like that. It's really cool. It's not putting ourselves above, below, or equal to anyone. In Buddhism, conceit is all of those. It's not above. And it's also not putting someone above us. And it's also not we're equal. It's everything is its own experience. Everyone has their own experience. Everyone has their own karma. Everyone has their own body. And so there is no equal. There's just realizing all of us are working our stuff out. All of us are acting according to our own experience. And so we can help our experience. As our capacity raises, we can help other beings with their experience. Uh, this type of practice, raise your hand if you've heard the word apophatic before. Okay, not apathetic. A lot of times I kind of mumble it and people think that, but apophatic, uh, if I recall, it's a Greek term, and uh, it refers to arriving at the transcendent through a process of letting go of what is not essential to it. So that's when I said it's kind of like being naked. You don't get naked by changing outfits. You get naked by taking stuff off. Or the Christmas tree. You find out what the Christmas tree actually is in its root form by taking the ornaments off. It's not putting on something better or different. It's just removing. And eventually you can't miss. If you take the stuff off, eventually you will arrive at what is. So in simple terms, we're releasing unnecessary contraction and that releases whatever is hindering completely integrating with now. Integrating with now is not something you have to do. It is hindered by sort of parasitic processes. And as we release those, you will find you are more and more now until now is just like a button being held down. Nah, like that. It's just like that. This one step of releasing unnecessary contraction, if it's done skillfully, will allow the whole system of generating problems to melt and fall apart on its own. You don't have to know a ton of dharma. You don't have to know lists and why. You just have to know what to do and you have to swim a lot. You have to do it a lot and you will find out for your soul. What remains is the natural essence and function of being. Uh, one of the Buddhist uh, analogies is like refining a rock with gold in it. As what is not gold keeps being removed through the process, you start to find out what gold is. It's not being told what gold is. It's not hearing about gold. It's not having it on a shelf somewhere. It's literally like having a glob of stuff that you keep running through a refinement process and now what is it like and then run it through again now what is it like and as we do that we start to discover the properties of gold uh this gold the gold of our true nature is amazing and uh relieving and simple and beautiful but don't take my word for it just find out um, whether sitting or walking, the practice is realizing and releasing contraction while blank. Let's fill in some of those blanks. While judgments are happening, while there's a big tense thing in my chest, while emotion comes up, while intense peace seems to manifest, while there's an itch on my nose right here, while I stand up, while my knees hurt. It's the same thing. You... Don't fixate on the guests, which is the phenomena. You look at the how good of a host am I being for the guests. A good host gets out of the way. They let the guests be guests. So you've got to remove the friction, remove the contraction, let the guests do their guest behavior. And then you find out this whole thing runs as soul. And I've been like trying to make it run well. 
and I'm actually making it worse than if it just ran itself. Well, recognizing and releasing contraction, the rest of the operation of things is turned over to natural function. Let adjustments be made when needed by fuel, like how we adjust while sleeping or walking. That's a subtle thing that's happening as we're doing this, is if you look for tension and you try to release it and you try to relax, you're accidentally turning over how you're breathing and your balance and like how time passes and how your mind behaves to something that's not being controlled by you. And you'll accidentally find out it knows how to do it really well. So I'm giving you a job that's a very simple job. And by doing that, you, you kind of let the other jobs do the thing. And that's as much as you can embrace that, you'll find out for yourself. Does that really in, uh, result in an improvement or is it bad? Do things just crash and burn? The mind is left to be however it is as we practice our method. Awareness remains on monitoring the experience for contraction that does not have to be there. So we let the mind be the mind. We let thoughts be thoughts. Thoughts come up. Most of our problems, I'm not going to say all because all, maybe, I don't know if it's ever totally true, but most of our problems are thoughts. And if we let thoughts come and go freely, most of our problems come and go freely. They don't really land. They don't do what normally happens to us. This allows naturally existing systems to rebalance towards homeostasis, just as how the body already tends to rebalance and heal. So uh, my dad was a doctor growing up, and uh, when I was in therapeutic and clinical massage school, they talked about a lot of the times, if a doctor's not gonna do surgery, if you go and see them, they'll check you out so that you feel like you've been assessed. And then eventually they're gonna say, two weeks or three weeks of rest, make sure you get enough sleep, drink a lot of water. What they're really saying is, the body is gonna heal itself if you don't mess it up. And that's what we have to allow to happen. There's a system for that spiritually and emotionally that does that. But every time it's shy. So every time we go back in a mess, it stops. It's working, goes, whoa, I don't want to get in the way. And then when we let it, it starts rebalancing things again. So we have to run experiments, maybe with little tiny things at first, to see, is it okay? Does it resolve? Like Alex was saying, I tried tagging that thing to see if it will be there later. And then you'll start realizing sometimes it's not. You'll get confidence from that. It's not something I have to convince you of. It's you got to run the experiment and see, does that happen? Wow, that's kind of crazy. If it does or no, it doesn't work here yet. And I talk about a lot that this skill is like, it's a really, another really bad analogy, but it's like a magical wood chipper. Like you stick branches in there and it chips them up. And those things have like a hole to stick stuff in. And if you try to stick something too big in there, it jams it. But this wood chipper, every time you stick something that it can chew up in there, it gets a little bigger and the engine gets a little more powerful. And then you stick stuff in there, gets a little bigger, the engine gets a little more powerful. And eventually you start wondering, can I jam this thing? And then you start wondering, could anything jam this thing? And that's a good problem to have. So level up that wood chipper, throw in lots of little stuff that you don't care about anyways, contraction you don't care about, release that, see what happens. So sometimes I think I know what contraction is and how to release it, and sometimes I don't. Um, I guess specifically, you know, sometimes there's like physical tension and, you know, I could, you know, think about moving and, and releasing that. Um, sometimes it's more like my, you know, like my, my attention, my sense of awareness is shrunk, right? Like I feel like I'm trapped in my head, right? Or, or wrapped around a thought or something. Um, and that's not always tied to physical tension, or if it is, it's not always the case that I can fix it that way. Um, so it feels like I end up trying to do some move, like sort of blowing up my awareness like a balloon, you know, like sort of pushing it to be bigger. And 
that feels like kind of not the right thing. Like it's it's effortful and it doesn't usually blow up that far. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if there's anything you want to say to that. Yeah, that, I mean, it sounds like you're learning intuitively. That's There's a lot of this stuff, especially with the inner experience of our mind. There's just no language that really, what is that thing? Like I could even make up a word or tell you the word and you're never going to know how to apply it to the right thing because we can't share minds so vividly that we can like make a one-to-one -one correlation. So what I can say is, it sounds like you're doing trial and error and it sounds like you're learning. I tried blowing this thing up, that's not it. Or maybe not right now, maybe later I'll try it again. That's exactly how you get it. It's a process of elimination. But a clue is if when you do it, things get tighter, it's probably not that right now. So you keep looking for that. Um, there's a type of contraction is just the best word I could come up with. And I've changed that word a lot of times. And none of them are like the best word, but that's the best one I can say right now. So whatever it is, if I told you to like solve a riddle and you have 30 seconds and then your eyebrows come together, whatever it is that makes that happen inside your mind, that's contraction also. And it's not a physical thing, or maybe it is. Some people feel it almost like in the middle of your head, a little spot gets tight. Um, don't limit it. Be very loose with that word. If it feels like anything is kind of getting rigid or drawing together or guarding, anything like that, see if it can be like a, a ribbon tossed in a river. You just walk in it, like go along with the water. Does that make sense? Uh, I mean, not really, but <laughs> I'll work with it. Uh, all you have to do at the root is just when you do notice contraction, release it. There's a root skill hook here that I just called the skill of release. Just learn the skill of release. You can actually practice it by tightening your hand up and then letting go. Uh, there's there's uh, one kind of movement healing system called somatics. And in somatics, they talk about sensory motor amnesia, that we have a, a, like a lot of us have muscle tonus that feels normal, but it's actually tighter. And you can't relax it because it feels relaxed. What you can do is make tension in it. And then when you let go, you learn how to let go of what you made. And you also learn how to let go of what's there that you couldn't. You can do that with stuff internally. You can find tension and make it tighter and then let go and learn, did anything after come with it? Is trying a synonym for contraction sometimes? It can be, but when you can do release contraction while doing blank, you can do release contraction while trying. So you can try as hard as you want and you stay soft, like you stay free, freely changing. Uh, in Taoism, they would call this skill free and easy wandering. I mean, you just kind of noodle your way through life like, oh, okay, I need to pay these bills. Yeah, what am I going to do next? Looks like I got to go to work. You just kinda, it's just kind of, you just change. But not in a stupid way. It's like, you know, very perceptive. For some reason, it's enjoyable to do even the most mundane stuff. You just kind of make a Tao out of it, an art out of it. So you can make an art out of really focusing or trying to do something. But uh, Ajahn Chah, I think I have this in my notes for later, but Ajahn Chah has the famous saying, he said, have you ever seen still water? Have you ever seen flowing water? Have you ever seen still flowing water? And that's a description of the awakened mind. We know flowing and we know still, and we know how we can be those ways. But eventually, the mind can have activity, but it's like a ghost. It doesn't move anything in it. It stays totally still. And eventually, the world's activity, you're like a ghost. It just goes right through you. And you can move with it if you want. So if you want to go, you can. And as soon as you don't want to, you're like a ghost. It just...
Yeah. So I guess I'm curious what the difference is between tension and discomfort. Uh, Cause I, in this last time, I just was very focused on being comfortable and moving my body. However, that, however, to make that feel right. And it felt really good and nice and easy, but I'm almost like suspicious of how easy it felt. And I was wondering if maybe that means I'm not doing it right, or if you might be on to something. Like okay. when I talk about making adjustments constantly, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Eventually, if you make adjustments like that, you'll reach a point where you don't need to do that to feel comfortable. Yeah. And it is really easy. So it might be that. It might be tightening up due to preference and then moving with preference and then tightening up and moving with them. It's that you need to release the contraction. So just look at, is there contraction as I do it? But you have my permission to make your meditation look like this if you want. Wait, can you <laughs> clarify what that second part, second thing might, what was? That would be that your adjustment always has a tension that makes you have to do it or else it's it's almost like an impulse arising. Like if you need to say something and you're kind of waiting your turn, mm. that feeling, that kind of back pressure, like you need to release the tension anytime you feel that. But you can do the thing, you can move, you can adjust and you can make it feel nicer. And if that works for you, you'll eventually satiate whatever it is that's unhappy. Um, during the last sit, I felt so hot. Like it was like this. Um, this happened to me on the last retreat. I went on like I suddenly got like so nauseous feeling that I felt, oh, I have to get up. And then this time, like I got so hot that it was like, I have to get up. And I don't exactly know what my question is, but my hunch is like it's sort of a manufactured like for lack of a better metaphor, almost like the like algorithm of my body is like, let me do the thing that like is definitely going to make you have to get up and like mm -hmm. leave whatever's happening. Um, yeah, like just the really hotness and then I went away and then I got like intense sleepiness and. Yeah, uh, one that's that probably will happen to everybody at some point where your mind says, are we really doing this? And if you say, yeah, we're releasing contraction while well, you can do anything, it says, what if I do this? How about this? How about, it's like a little kid, like trying to get bad attention. Like, what if I stick this knife in the electric socket? Are you gonna stop me then? Like, and the answer has to be across the board. Yeah, you do whatever you want. And then it plays itself out. So part of it is that, uh, potentially. Part of it is this frees up as emotions and tensions and stuff are released. What has been tied up in them frees up as the circulation of vital energy. And you may start to perceive it. And once you start to perceive it, it often shows up as heat for people or feelings of coolness. You can feel like a wind is blowing in your body or spontaneous movement. You can have like waves go through you all kinds of stuff. Just let it sort itself out. The system that manages it is not you. You can experience it, don't micromanage it. Just let it sort itself out. Uh, I have a list on my phone. Maybe I'll read it later tonight, but uh, I keep it on there. It's a list of phenomena that can happen when you do a Qigong or, or a Dao Yin. And most meditations are a Qigong or a Dao Yin. And so, those phenomena are supposed to happen when you do it. It's part of the process. And one of them is heating up. A lot of times, in fact, that's so much the case. There's a, there's a documentary I watched a long time ago on hermits in China. Uh, and one, one of them says, it gets so cold up here in the winter, I meditate right before bed and I get warm enough that I climb in and in the morning when I'm freezing again, I just meditate in bed until I'm warm enough, and then I get out. So I want you to know that like really happens. That's a common thing for some people. And it's usable. Uh, Tibetan practices, there's something called Tumo. Tumo is like a type of yoga that uses that. Taoism has some practices also that do that work with heat in the body. 
uh, but it's a natural thing and you can like play with that system or it can just happen. But it's usually a byproduct of more free circulation of breath, blood, chi, et cetera. So if you get in the posture, you're upright, you relax, you become freely changeable. A lot of the stuff that has been like your little emergency brakes that were on all over your body, they start to come off. And the friction that was, the effort that was required to keep those on gets freed up and it starts moving around your system. And then you feel a flush, or sometimes it will change your posture. Your spine will straighten up or it'll wave. There's lots of things that it does, but they're supposed to happen. Uh, nausea, I can't say for sure, nausea, but uh, I can say sometimes when something breaks free, it does feel like that. It can be kind of, ooh, like it's like needs to rebalance itself. Can you talk more about bodhicitta in relation to this practice? Yeah, how many people here know that word? Raise your hand if you know bodhicitta. So bodhicitta is, uh, I think it's universal to Buddhism, but it's possible to be exposed to sex of Buddhism that don't talk about it as that word or don't emphasize it the same way, but it's where you end up heading. And um, the most common way I hear it talked about is kind of the Tibetan way or the Zen way. So the Zen way, you have the four great vows. And whenever you say there, those, that's kind of bodhicitta. And in Tibetan, it's something like, you know, may all merits and benefits of this practice be given out to all beings with none of it kept over for myself. And um, that's another one of those, like I was saying to you, those different steps that are different when you're on them. So part of what it's saying is if you're at the place where you are sort of a, a me that accumulates merit and benefit, then the most powerful practice to transcend that feeling is to give it away over and over again. Because, because the, the energy of contraction looks like this, right? If I do it with my hand, it's like this. What's the energy I'm giving? You have to go like this. Contract, give. So when you practice giving, every time you do that, you're learning release. It's another way to do it. And we think like, well, I don't want to give all the time because whenever I give, this stuff falls out of my hand. But if you learn to do this, you can do that and see if anyone wants it. And sometimes it may stay there for 20 years, but you don't have to hold it like that the whole time, right? So bodhicitta is really this. And everything we're doing is that, right? Over and over, look for this, turn it into that. Look for this, turn it into that. Look for contraction release it. We're not saying get it out of here whenever I open it. That's not up to me. I'm just saying, I'm just going to hold it like this. And uh, I have some friends that as they've gotten older, they've gotten really into birds. This seems to just be a thing that happens for a lot of people. Um, <laughs> I think they're like weirdly fascinating too. So, uh, but if you want like hummingbirds or like a cardinal or something that come to your house. I don't know of anyone that is like setting elaborate traps for them, right? Mm -hmm. Like you start to like learn the art of setting conditions. I mean, I like the kind of trees they like, the kind of bushes they like, maybe put out a feeder, the kind of feed they like. And then when they come, you're like changing the conditions to better invite that. And so that's a way of like holding the birds like this. See, like they can leave when they want, they can come back, but I'm gonna make this a really awesome resting spot for birds so that they come there a lot. But it's not the same as doing that where it may not be awesome for them. And I'm like, no, you can't leave, you know? So this is contraction. This is uh, being freely changeable. Um, bodhicitta is this. It's, it can even be this, hold this, and as soon as someone else needs it, I can do that. Like I can freely open the hand. And uh, Shohaku Okamura calls that opening the hand of thought. So the hand of thought fixates on something 
And it's okay that it does that because there are times where we need that, but most of us are really good at this part and really bad at this part. So we have to practice this over and over and over until they're equal. Until when it's applicable, you do that. And when it's not appropriate, we do this. I mean, let things go like that, right? So all of that to me is bodhicitta. Uh, the different ways of developing it are ways to get you to do something that gets you to open in some way over and over and over again and to consider other beings instead of being the main character. That's the two pieces. You have to be able to see you're not the main character. And then when you don't feel like you're the main character, you have to be able to respond to the needs of what you're perceiving. And that's being able to respond or change is yin yang, like shifting in the yang. And that's opening and closing as appropriate. And then you have to know what to open and close to. So you have to have perceive what's going on around you. And then you change freely with it. So as I teach it, I teach kind of like a early Zen slash Taoist version of bodhicitta, which is just natural. It's open, open, open. And then once you know how to do that, perceive what's happening and just try to have together action with it. And that's changing freely. If someone throws you a ball, catch it. If you want to throw the ball, open your hand. You know, if someone hands you money, Take it. If you want to spend money, let go of it. And we have to do that with our mind. A thought comes in, should I hold this? Should I feed it? No, don't catch it. If something needs to be emitted from us, issue it. So it's like being able to be a very effective, uh, what's the word I sometimes use? Like a decisive action. Like being able to do the appropriate action and really do it. And there are places in there, I mean, think of a parent, there may be some place for losing your temper if the child you're around needs that to grow. And for another child, that may be completely inappropriate. And applying a template to them is probably not the greatest thing. But when you start to say, what is actually going to help them? That's what you need to be able to do, not what you want to do, not your preference, just Boom, like just change, change. And then you look at how it landed. Oh, that's not right. I'm not going to do that again. Boom, this. So that's all to me what bodhicitta is. Bodhicitta is changing until you're like kelp underwater in the currents of the ocean and you just, you just change and move with the world as it goes. But it doesn't mean I'm less important. It means you're part of it and you do your function within it. Just, so it's bodhicitta translates like awakens mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it translates as awakened mind. And to illustrate those steps, it means awakened mind, right? I just said that. But then if you get on a different step, if you look for your mind, you can't find anything that is a mind. So what is an awakened mind? It's not made to make you frustrated it's just there are different realities if you have a mind it's good to have an awakened one if you have an awakened one and someone says you have a mind you would laugh at them where is it there is no separate thing called mind if you look for it you can try find the edge of it it's actually everything you ever experience the whole universe you could say is mind and it's still a bad word for it universe is not a great word for it either it's just this even that's not a great word for it. It's just. So, natural function is what I'm pointing at. We've been focusing on releasing, noticing, releasing, settling. But that's all allowing space for natural function to show itself. And most of us don't really realize what that is or that it is. So some simple things. Um, number one, let's try it together again. Breathe out and then let the in-breath happen when it wants to. Yeah. 
And if you're not sure, hold it for a while. Tell you, it'll tell you increasingly that it wants to. Like it has a strong voice. It can show up really powerfully. So breathe out and just wait until it really, really wants to, then let it. Okay, so now if you could harmonize with that in-breath instead of controlling it, you're letting something else breathe. And that thing can do a lot more than that, but there's, that's a simple place to find it. Someone asked about the difference between contraction and discomfort. If you get a shot, like an injection, the discomfort is the feeling of it. The contraction is if you go like that. Right, like you can do either. You can just let it go in and go out and it hurts, or you can let it go in and you go like that. So that contraction is that step of how we respond to something like discomfort. Okay, another one. Sit really crook crooked, close your eyes, and then straighten by feel. So really take yourself off kilter until it's not quite comfortable. Slouch as much as you can. And then by feel, Relieve yourself from that ache. That thing that does all those motions, how it does that, it will be different every time it's dynamic. That's the same thing. We're letting that thing operate. We're learning to hear its voice or feel its voice. Uh, it's in how we adjust position when sleeping. There's a, I think it's in the, it's one of the sets of koans uh, in Zen, but the question is in there, what is the meaning of the thousand arms of Guanyin Bodhisattva? Guanyin is Avalokiteshvara. But most people, have you, has anyone not seen something that has like a thousand arms around it or a lot of arms? Okay, so what is the meaning of that? And the answer is, it's like when you fix your pillow while you're asleep or when you look for your pillow while you're sleeping. So. It's function. The only way that the thousand arms could move is not by thinking of each arm. It's by letting that thing that fixes your pillow do it. And there's another kind of then joke about the centipede that's walking along and then another bug says to it, how do you keep your legs coordinated and then it trips? <laughs> because as soon as it has to think about it, it can't do it. We all have some of that. We've all felt that before, right? Like uh, in martial arts, I know Lots of times when I was working on a certain method or technique and someone would hit me and I'd be caught thinking and I'd get hit by it and then I'd do it because I was thinking about it. But then when it's just part of you, you just kind of move with stuff and you just, it's just that thing. They call that no mind sometimes. It's like the mind doesn't get in the way. Um, it's how we stretch. So let's try that together. Take a big yawn and stretch and see how should it be. Why the heck was it that shape? That's what you gotta look at. Is it okay that it was that shape? That you don't decide it? What if that thing was allowed to self-medicate us a lot? What if whenever it wanted to do something like that, we made some space for it? Um, another one, one of my teachers early on, uh, was trying to impart this knowledge to me and it was really good for me. I was pretty ignorant at the time and he said, do you know when you've had too much pizza? And it's that feeling you get where you like still want it, but like, man, I don't know if I should eat any more of that. And a lot of people have also had that with something like tequila. They've had too much tequila and they that thing knows it does not want tequila anymore. Uh, there are lots of things like that. It may be, I knew people that worked in uh, like a fish factory in Alaska and then they're like, I just cannot smell that smell ever again like that thing gets fed up by it and you don't you could try to overrule it but you don't win right like it's very powerful <laughs> um the yin yang palms exercise this is also a form of it feeling i don't want to get too much into it for people that aren't into that thing but this is in Taoism. there's like a magnetic field issuing you know from the feet to the head, it looks like a magnetic field. And you're basically tuning into the two polarities of that and then saying, well, what needs, what's out of whack? There's too much of which. 
and you're just kind of letting your body, it doesn't even need to know what it is. It can still tell, should I get more or less of which, what feels nice? So we're, that's another way to tune into it without thinking. Um, how do we select our next bite from our plate? If you don't think about it, you'll find yourself doing that anyways. It's that thing usually, sometimes with quite a bit of greed mixed in with it. Uh, and if you want to know if there's greed there, while you're eating, pick your next bite and then just drop your fork and feel what it feels like. There's like a thing that comes up in you. That's the greed. That's the contraction. Um, we can't do this one together, but I should have said it before lunch. What controls the tongue as we eat? Seriously, watch that just for five seconds. Take a bite, eat, and just watch what your tongue does. You have nothing to do with that. You can move it too, but whatever's doing it, it's like dodging teeth and moving things around and just doing all this crazy stuff. Uh, this is all becoming aware of natural function. What we're doing is tuning into it and letting it run things more and more. And then we're maintaining a continual light awareness, which is what it uses as its senses. So saying it's a roommate or it's like a horse or anything, they're all, if you, if you experience it deeply enough, those things are not gonna be good descriptors, but if you haven't experienced it yet, they're very good. That it's, the mind is not a machine that you pull a lever and then press a button and it spits out what you want. But we try to treat it that way. It's a lot more like, maybe like a circus elephant. You can do that to it, but eventually it kills somebody because of that. Because it gets so, that's not how it works. But it also can be, you can just give it space and give it what it needs and then let it be what it is. And since it's mind and there's a body in it, it does intelligent things with the body. And since it's a mind and there are thoughts in it, it does intelligent things with the thoughts. And um, we can learn from watching how it handles them. And part of what we learn is, should I be controlling all this stuff or should I leave it up to that? So. But hopefully we got enough practice to get things away from just words. And we start to find like so many experiences, a word is pretty good to point to it, but it's really bad at describing like the whole, what it's like. And so uh, I come from, especially the Zen in Chan lineages I practice with, they really try to get away from words. They say like, if you're eating a watermelon and someone says, how is that watermelon? You just cut off a piece and you say, bite it. And that, that's that's so much better than saying, oh, it's pretty good, it's a little not right, blah, blah, blah. That's pretty descriptive when we say that, but the person never really gets it. Whereas if you just give it to them, they might like it. You might not like it, and they like it, and that's how it is. So I'm trying to kind of give enough opportunity that we can actually find out for ourselves, what is this like? Is this any good? Does it do anything? <clears throat> and one of the similes I'd like to share uh, that I find so helpful is if you had a large bull or cow and they're behaving poorly, one way that you can deal with them is to just move them by themselves into a giant pasture and just let them be natural. And they'll maybe act out at first. But if there's nothing to do but for them to just do what they do, eat, go to the bathroom, sleep, lay down, walk, stand up, <clears throat> and you never force them to do anything, you may find it just self-regulates them after a while. They just kind of reach their natural comfort in their own skin. And all we have to do is check on that ox, tending the ox or the bull or the cow. We just check on it. The contraction 
is us kind of getting in the pasture with them and saying, maybe you should come over here. You don't need to do that. You just need to let it have its space and then watch it so that we know how it's doing. And it knows how it's doing by us knowing how it's doing. So by awareness, knowing what's taking place, our nature uses that same awareness to know how what's taking place is working and whether it should change things. So it's a really weird dynamic to put in the words, but it's pretty simple to do once you get a feel for it. And then you might think, well, maybe it's not that, it's something else. Just experiment until you realize most of us, I don't know, raise your hand if at some point today, without you controlling it, your mind wasn't that busy. That's a lot of people. Like if I, if I told you this retreat is about having a quiet mind, I bet you less people would raise their hand. If I tried to teach a technique that makes you get quiet, less people would raise their hand. It's a lot of techniques. It's like 30, 35% of people work really well for, and then 50% of the rest, it's like, maybe I'm doing it. And then some people are like, no, this is hard now. It's not happening. Um, maybe that's better. Uh, so by leaving the bull or the cow in the pasture, it naturally, it's busy when it needs to be busy. It's quiet when it can be quiet. And it feels nice. It starts to be natural. And we can start to realize maybe a quiet mind when it's not appropriate for it to be quiet is not the right wish for us to have. And maybe a busy mind, when it's helpful to be busy, would be good. Um, it reminds me of a book that someone gave me when I was younger. I think it was called The Gift of Fear. But I was a sport fighter when I was younger, and I hated, I loved fighting. I hated waiting for my fight. Like, I'd get there sometimes, it was six or seven hours, and I'd be looking at every single person. I wonder if it's them. I wonder if it's them. And there's just this, like, you never know if it was five minutes from now or three hours from now that you're going to go in there. And then you just, it'd be you, you, and you'd look at the person for the first time, hey, bam, you have to hit each other. It's like a crazy thing, right? And um, I would notice when I got in there, my anxiety and everything would just vanish. But leading up to it, it would, I hated it. It was way worse than fighting. Uh very uncomfortable and draining. And so anyways, I read this book, The Gift of Fear, and from what I remember of it, it said something like the fear response is everything you want. If it comes up, like it gives you energy, it makes you pay attention, you get very interested in what's going on, you're very sharp, you have the motivation to do something about it. But I realized I was making it into a problem. I was making it fear. And I was saying, I should be some other way. I should be super calm or whatever. When I realized this is a natural thing, I started to say, awesome, thank you. I'm so glad it's here. Like, what if I wasn't like that? Uh, I'd probably get hurt really bad. So we start to realize that maybe our conscious ideas of how our body and mind should be, maybe they have more information than we do. And um, one of the analogies I've seen, I think it's in Tibetan Buddhism, but they liken the mind and then our true nature to the conscious mind is like the rider on an elephant and then true nature is the elephant. And the rider thinks they drive the elephant. Like it feels like that. But when the elephant decides not to listen to the writer, that's when the writer realizes the actual power dynamic, which is really different. Uh, maybe this thing's going to kill me, you know, like, I, I don't know if I want to be here. But uh, we tend to do the same thing. We tend to think that writer, that driver is really what's doing things. And so I've been trying to show you the elephant. I've been trying to find ways for us to accidentally let the elephant act and realize I forgot to drive. And a lot of this, uh, it happens this way, where we we can forget to make ourselves. And um, 
another person, I can't remember who it was, but I remember a few years ago, I heard this. They said, the feeling of self is the most powerful altered state you ever experience. And that's true. More than I think taking ayahuasca or DMT. It's, it's so inaccurate that if you realize what it's like without it, you will realize I'm on some freaking drugs. When I think it's this other way. Like, and man, yeah, I'm really sure that it's the right way to do stuff. And so it can be real difficult to untangle the soap and kind of snip the right wires one by one. There are ways to do that, but that's not how I've arrived at things. I've done that also, and it works. Uh, but once I, I found some ways that were simple and very direct and very palpable, I kind of found I was doing the stuff less and less that was uh, micromanaging it. Because sometimes, like I said, the self starts diffusing the self with you. It gets up there and it has a player in its hands and it's sniffing the wires. Yeah, we've got it. And it's right there, like it hides. Uh, my first Zen teacher likened awakening and the behavior of the self after it to a flock of birds. And so this flock of birds has always been out of your sight. And you finally see them. And then you walk over there and they all take off. And then you're like, for the first time, there are no birds in your tree or your yard. And that's like, oh, the self isn't here right now. You get to feel it. But usually then, like three of them land over here, 12 of them land over here, 24 of them land back here, one lands right in front of you. And then you go chase that one and it goes there and the others move. That's what the self starts to do. It starts to hide in the shadows and it leaves the spaces where it would be caught empty. And it's very easy for us to start thinking it's gone. Right. But like I said, it has a signature. The signature is contraction. And so if we learn to not look for the self, which can trick us, but we just manage contraction in our system. More and more, we'll see uh, there's a poem by uh, Lee Bell, I think his name was. Uh, it's in my email signature. And the last part of it says, I sit here just the mountain and I until only the mountain remains. And that's not saying something metaphorical. It's like relaxing, experiencing it until you kind of snap out of realizing like, oh, I wasn't doing anything. Like it, this was just, it was just the wind was blowing and the sun was hitting and warmth was being felt and all that, but no doing, no concept, no words, no, nothing. It was just like a pure experience. So we leave the bowl in a pasture, and when we allow the mind to play and find balance naturally, it basically is like the, the unruly parts of mind are a little bit like a stand-up comedian. They have a lot of material, but they need an audience so they won't perform all of it. And so the audience is our reaction. Like when we stop it or whatever, it, it will take any audience. But I, I remember at a state fair in Washington, I was there on like a Wednesday at one in the afternoon and there was a stamp comedian who had a stage time and he came up, but there was not really anyone around. And so he spent about three minutes like, hey folks, come here, let me, oh, come here. I've got something I want to say to you. Like he's kind of trying to call people in. And then like people, like two or three people walked by, but they didn't stop. And as they walked by, he said like one joke, and when they kept going, he just kind of shut down the operation. He was like, oh, I don't know. That's, that's how these parts of our mind work. They're looking for that pushback, that reaction and response. And uh, when we learn to relax it, even if it's already there, they may already be performing because it's already there. But as soon as we remove the audience, that contraction, they're now performing to like a dead crowd or an empty crowd. And then the mind just doesn't want to do it. And after it doesn't want to do it, it starts to question the hobby of doing it in the first place. Like if it never has a good audience, it's like, maybe I shouldn't be a stand-up comedian. I'll do something else. So 
Uh, I also put down here freely coming and going. That's kind of a byproduct of this as we release contraction in the system. Things start to freely come and go and what kinds of things, thoughts, feelings, sounds, the five condos or five scondos, the five aggregates. Without talking about emptiness and what's supposed to happen, we start to actually taste it. You're just feeling what is emptiness? Is that a good word for it? Maybe not, but you can feel whatever it is to some degree. It's unentanglement, it's freedom, it's clarity, it's simple, it's not draining. There's so many things that I could say about, but it's talking about swimming again. Just maybe you guys can tell me as you touch it. Um, there are three words in Taoism. I might reference them again, so I'll, I'll teach them to you. Three, their terms. One is Wu Wei, one is Ziran, and one is Wei Wu Wei. And uh, Wu Wei means Wu means absence or times zero, and then Wei means acting. And I would say maybe a lot of times it means like reacting. So Wu Wei is like the absence of reaction, not the absence of experiencing, but just absence of reactivity to what's being experienced. It does not mean the same as response. You can respond to something, but reacting is something that we kind of maybe shouldn't do and we can't help it. Response is like the right thing or a good thing or trying something in relation to something. It's But it's got a volitional feel to it. Like we can choose to respond or not. Reaction, maybe we can't choose to react or not. So Wu Wei is learning the skill of not always reacting. The impulse to react is natural to come up, but the need to do it is not a one-to-one -one with it. You don't have to have those two bonded. And so when we learn Wu Wei or the absence of reacting, this leaves a kind of space. The space has always been filled with reaction and ready to react. Waiting to react, I'm ready to react, I'm gonna react, now I'm reacting. What's the next reaction? And we actually, if you notice, most of us define ourselves by these reactions. I'm that kind of person. I'm an aversive person, or I'm a tough person, or I'm a nice person, or I'm a generous person. But it's like, I can't help but do that thing. But what are you if you didn't, if you weren't bound to reaction? What's your original face underneath all that? Uh, so we remove the reaction to find out. We just release the reaction. It doesn't mean we can't respond. The response can be identical to what our reaction would be but we can choose it instead of having it happen because we can't help it. So once we Wu Wei, what happens is this space that's always been filled is now just open and being known. And when it's being known and it's open, Xeron happens, which is a combination of like fate, karma, and whatever is naturally unfolding, it will come up and use that space. And it comes up anyways, but a lot of times it's blended with our reaction into like a soup, and we can't really tell what we're making happen and what wants to happen. And so we try to make everything happen eventually. But if we stop doing that, we start finding out that things happen anyways. Certain thoughts come up, like the thoughts that a person spoke about earlier of their, their car parking. Like that's... Zeron showing up. Should we check that thing? Should we check that thing? But it's it's different than reasoning your way to that. Because now it's artificial. It's like I've arrived at this through logic or something. Instead, it's just happening whether you want it to or not. So we leave space for Zeron to happen. And then because we're not controlling Zeron, we can feel that Zeron is not me. We can feel that it happens to me. I experience it but I don't get to pick it. But I can treat it like weather the way a surfer or a sailor handles weather. So you surf it, you have a place you wanna go and then the weather happens and then you figure out how to combine your skills 
with what happens to go where you want to go or try to. And sometimes you may realize I can't go there right now. The weather is not going to support it. And sometimes you're like, I can, but it's going to be crazy. I'll have to do it. And sometimes it's a straight shot. So this is Wu Wei, absence of reactivity, leaving space for Giron, which is naturally occurring. Also what karma brings up, what fate brings up. And then Wei Wu Wei is action without reactivity or acting without acting, which basically means you just let your natural responses surf it or sail it. And you just kind of make an art out of doing it until you either don't do that and you move on or you accomplish it. And you kind of learn how to go through life that way. I mean, my notes I have reacting is an, un an involuntary response. And Ziran is fate, karma, the natural unfolding, which also kind of sounds like it's an involuntary response. So uh, how do you distinguish those? Yeah, uh, Ziran isn't really a response. It is what I'm not making happen that happens anyways. Reaction is one of those. But there are lots of other things that are not a reaction to anything. It's just stuff uh, happens. Like thoughts just come up, but they don't come up because you already thought another thought. So reacting is itself a zero. It could be, yeah. It's like. But it's one where you try to have less. Yeah, because reaction is the specific one of something happens. And I feel like because of that, I have to do something. Right. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, zero would just be life happening. And, um, there, there are complex and simple ways to talk about it, but like one simple one is if you try to lay on your back in a bed for 70 hours, you probably will move at some point. Like you'll just get restless, your body will move. Even though you've decided I want to do that, you'll feel this, these impulses arise to do something else. That's zero. It's just the, the that doesn't really want to happen. Um, zero also is just like, you go for a walk and then you run into someone you haven't seen in 10 years, like just stuff that was going to happen or it just happened, mm -hmm. but you didn't make it. You didn't aim for it at all. Right. And most of life is that most of life is that stuff. So, uh, how much of it we perceive is based off how much we live the stage open. If we're always doing zero on gets to show itself barely ever. Cause it's mostly the stage is filled with my plans, what I'm going to do next. How do I be effective, et cetera? But when we start to leave more open time, there's a blend. We kind of do stuff and then we say, I wonder what's going to roll in. And then we do stuff and I wonder what's going to roll in. And uh, for example, all the stuff I'm saying right now, I'm not thinking about it before I say it, it's rolling in. But if I didn't do that, I would have to read it to you like this. And hopefully what your question was, was on this sheet, right? So. When we talk, Zeron is usually active, like it's just coming up. So we learn those three things. You don't have to remember the terms, but remember the idea. One is freedom from reactivity, opening the hand of thought, releasing contraction, however you want to think of it, resting back. Once you do that, you leave enough space for enough time that other stuff has a chance to use the space. And then we see what happens. And then if any of it is useful, we roll with it. You do something with it. Um, I think dancing, partner dancing probably has a lot of that if you're doing it well. I've only done a tiny amount of it, but it feels like skillful, skillful dancing is feeding things into it and also feeling what's happening and responding. Body work, absolutely, I feel like. If you're a good body worker, a good acupuncturist, whatever, you're doing it all by like, you do one thing and then you see what happens and that tells you everything else you do. And if you go in with a plan, a lot of times that doesn't match up very well with what actually needs to happen. Okay, so I think those are my principles for today. Uh, what we're looking to do is the first skill is Wu Wei, which is just not always being busy, not always responding, not always reacting. And we do that by releasing tension, releasing contraction. The byproduct or side effect of that is there starts to be some spaciousness in the experience. Our senses get more vivid and things get simpler. 
because we're not responsible for everything. And then the neat part is there's some weird way for stuff to just roll in and for us to respond to it that makes a whole life by itself without planning everything. And then you can combine them, however is scopeful for you, but it's different than most of our model, which is only the first thing. Poorly, it's reacting to everything, that's my life. Reacting to things, this is my, these are my only choices now because this is who I am and this is how I have to be. Climate scientists have information on how to keep the world from ending <laughs> because of whatever mankind is doing. Here's the information. And it's no, you know, so the powers that be do not seem to be interested. We have a downward spiral, it looks like, and on and on to various other things happening around us. So, uh, so, the Buddha had information, you know, the noble truths, and what if no one was interested? You know, is, is I don't know if this is a rhetorical question, but um, he's offering, he offered information. What if no one was interested? Uh, they're the first person he ran into after he awakened, that's what happened. So I can tell you what I know of that story. He gets up and he's walking along and this person sees his countenance, his presence, there's something about him. And this person says, what's the deal with you? I'm obviously paraphrasing. I don't think that's, <laughs> they spoke English slang like them, but uh, he's like, what's, you know, what's up with you? And he says, I'm a fully awakened Buddha. He kind of just says what happened to him. And then the person, I'll do it because I think doing it is more clear than saying what it says, but it says he stuck his tongue out and wagged his head, which is like, and then he walked off. <laughs> so that person did not take the thing. He was holding it like, hey, I'm a Buddha. What do you want to know? And the person was like, eh, not my thing. So all I can say is there are some Dharma teachers that are way more qualified than me to talk about human affairs like that from the materialist standpoint of being a human being but what you'll find out as you do a practice like this is that what you think you are is not what you are and uh as you start to experience that directly what matters is how you react to the world that is doing that that's shaking its head and wagging its tongue at that stuff and doesn't want it. And you do whatever is useful. You integrate in any way that you can, you. Anytime you have an opportunity to do something, but don't try to control the outcome, just add your part. And then whether it works or not, whether it drastically changes things or not, stay free of restriction. And what you are, will have the best possible outcome and the way you could influence the world around you will have the best possible outcome that I know of. And that's the best thing I can offer. I, I think the world is in like a difficult place, but man, also in the time of the Buddha, like there are people, there are princes that just fed people molten lead balls down their throat just for fun. Like there's a lot of like torture in his time and stuff by rich people that just could do that stuff. That didn't sound like a great world either. Uh, and he somehow wasn't caught in that, but he also wasn't aiding that. He just was kind of like, affect what you can, don't affect what you can't. So I think we can open the hand, we can offer it, but as soon as we start like opening someone's mouth and shoving it down their throat, they're gonna just cough it back up. So the most we can do is develop compassion. It's offered. If it's not taken, if it's not, you know, if it's not being beneficial to the planet, to humanity, to democracy, we all, all that we can do is watch it with compassion. And that's uh, the, the last thing I'll say. That, that, <laughs> that will take a lot. I mean, that, that is taking a lot. Yeah, it, I, I can't say I have the only answer. I can only speak from my own experience, but um, I can say 
part of our concern is based around our selfish nature. So there was a time, as far as we know, where there was not life on earth and we had nothing to do with life being here. And if we wreck the planet, maybe another billion years, there will be life on the planet again. It, from the geologic time scale, you can't wreck anything. You, things just change. I mean, if if a world killing meteor hit the earth, it would wreck it just as much as we can, right? It's like many nuclear explosions going off at once. So to think of it like we hold all of that and we need to do something about it. I'm not saying we shouldn't try, but I am saying it's actually how much it stirs us is maybe more of the problem than what happens because what happens is going to happen. We may save the planet and a year later, the world killing meteor hits the planet, right? We just don't, it's not up to us. But what is up to us is life, bodies always appear within consciousness. So we, we curate the quality of the consciousness and that's by what we leave for what's after us. Is it a memory of contraction or is it a memory of freedom? That's how I look at it. But I really appreciate that question. And I bet you there are people that teach here that have a way better answer than me. So listen to them, please. Too. There's a, a saying from Filipino martial arts, which is I'll fix it in the mix. And that's, that's an awesome thing I've used throughout my whole life, not just there, uh, that you can just get started on something. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to know everything about it. You can learn in it through osmosis, as long as it's not a uh, jumping off cliff. There are certain things you'll only get one chance to learn. So, uh, but as long as you have a chance to learn, fix it in the mix and also find helpful guidance. But that's swimming. Swimming is fixing in the mix. You just start and you keep evolving and trying things. And uh, that's the athlete. The next easiest person, but a little more difficult to learn it, is the person that tends to work with their hands. And that can be manual labor, pottery, painting, calligraphy, origami, or whatever. But it's that you kind of like, ha you hold the idea in your mind, but when you do it with your hands, sometimes what you had in your mind doesn't happen with your hands. And you just have to deal with it and kind of on the fly work with it. So there's still that quality in there. More difficult to learn is the academic or the intellectual. And that's because we start to hold things as like, this is a principle or an idea, and then it needs to match that. Instead of holding it as a question, is it gonna match that? And then the hardest is the philosopher. Uh, and that's because the philosopher may easily slip into not swimming at all, but loving swimming. I love talking about swimming, I love pictures of swimming, and that feels like swimming, but swimming is actually just swimming. Even if you're not into it, swimming is swimming. We learn that way. Okay, so uh, again, when we release tension or contraction, Xeron or what is natural starts to come up in our body and mind experience, and some Examples of that that you can see today are how do I select the next bite from my plate or from my sandwich, wherever I'm eating. If you don't decide, just watch how you kind of look at it and an idea, oh, there, how it just kind of comes up. Uh, what controls the tongue as we eat? That is such a cool one if you can do that. Just take a bite and watch what your tongue does as you do it for like five seconds or one second. It's whatever it is, I'm not driving it actively. And when I do, a lot of times I bite my tongue. So <laughs> you just let it do its thing. What walks while we're talking on the phone or if we get really involved in something? Uh, and then we'll say, well, that's no good because you can trip during that or whatever. But the, wa the thing that's walking is not the problem. The thing that's walking uses the same senses. And when our senses aren't paying attention to anything to do with walking, it's blindly walking, but it's still holding the balance, placing the feet, deciding how, the, what order the toes come down, do you roll across your ball, do you turn your foot out or in, how much does your knee bend, and it's learning. 
constantly and adapting constantly. So if we tune into these things, we can start asking, can I turn more and more of my natural function to this while helping the system just remain free of uh, unnecessary contraction and tension? So we turn it over and then that thing is hindered just like our conscious experiences <laughs> by not being able to change freely and by being locked up. So the more we soften and uh, maybe become supple, changeable, and perceptive of the need for change, the more that system can perform at a higher level and learn at a higher level. Uh, I'll add an aside, uh, I have uh, an older friend who has been a journalist and involved in the Dharma and Indian spiritual systems for a very long time. And uh, he remarked in passing one day when we were just hanging out how so many different beings he's met that were potentially realized or just very changed in a way that seemed different from the average person. Uh, how they shared in common that a lot of times they're very soft and it's not necessarily their spirit is soft but their body it's be like their hands or their face or their gaze or something there's usually some quality in them that is weirdly soft compared to the average person and uh you can probably see how that correlates with what we're practicing of releasing releasing tension until we find our natural way let's see if i have anything else before we get started here Um, I encourage you to, to check if we observe this process and experiment with it regularly, how does it feel to operate in this way? Like actually just see, is this an improvement? I think most Dharma is really good to do that with. See if it's an improvement. And maybe sometimes if it's not right now, try it later. See if in different situations it plugs in. But find out in actual. Like just find out for yourself, just try it and see if you get burned by it or if it improves things. And that's how we, uh, we know what to do. There's a sutta called the Kalama Sutta that's famous in, I think, almost every sect of Buddhism. And it's a group of a village called the Kalamas uh, that had a bunch of spiritual teachers in Ind India and maybe from beyond, but they coming through there pretty regularly. And so when the Buddha came through, they just said, listen, like we have a lot of People come through and say things. How do we know what to listen to? How do we know if something's good? And he basically, he gives this really good list. It would still be perfect for people today, whether you're looking for a yoga teacher or Qigong or a mentor or anything, is don't go by their ethnicity. Don't go by what they look like. Don't go by what they say. Don't go by the clothes they wear. He kind of just gives this whole thing that like, what you should look at is when they say what to do, you should try it and you should see what happens. And then you should try it again and see what happens. And that is the real way. And I think that's such a cool, simple way. And I'm encouraging the same thing here. Don't trust me, just try it and see for yourself. And then the last thing I have is uh, three terms that I used yesterday that come from Taoism. Uh, they're found in Chinese, Chinese Buddhism as well, but these may be helpful. So the first is, Wu Wei, and Wu Wei is to release reaction, release reactivity. It does not mean not respond. It means that specific type of response that we feel like we have to do that may not be wise, that's like a knee jerk thing. Release the tension that causes that. And then when we do that, a space opens up for other in internal family systems, which is like a, a model in psychology, it would be for other parts to have their chance to talk, not just hogging the microphone the whole time. And so when that happens, the community of our experience gets to shed its light on things instead of one perspective. And the community is often much more interesting and draws from much more information. So we make space for that, and that arising that comes up when we make that space is called ziran. Ziran means what's natural unfolds. And then when what's natural unfolds, 
by just not being tense, we'll naturally know what unfolds. And as knowing what unfolds happens, we can apply that four ounces to move a thousand pounds. We can kind of see, and I, I think of that like surfing or sailing. You kind of see what the weather's like, you see what's happening, and then you try to harmonize to catch that wave or catch the wind in a certain way and then move with it and see what we can do with that. So just like yesterday, uh, we'll do a seated practice and then I'll ring a bell at the end. You're allowed to change posture, change your actual posture from seated to standing, to sitting in a chair, to kneeling, whatever you'd like, anytime, but when you do it, just bow out of respect to everyone else that you're causing a disruption and then do it uh, intelligently, considerately. You can micro adjust your body any moment. I encourage that. In fact, you can try when you feel tension or contraction, play with wriggling free from it. Just see if you can do that by feel. And let that process evolve and see what happens. Uh, and the other way to work with contracture or contraction is when we find it, we can just tag it like we're tagging something as a for sale item. And that act will allow the system that manages our body and mind to release it in its own time. And so we don't have to manage whether it goes away. We just say there's some contraction, there's some tension. Does that need to be here? And you can just ask that into your mind and then move on. All right, so the first thing we do is we check the legs and we want the legs in a stable, comfortable and safe feeling position. And the main emphasis is that were we to sit for double as long as we sit, you potentially wouldn't ever be pulled out of the practice by concern for the legs, like they're gonna be damaged or overstretched or anything. So find what that is for you and don't have your knees, if you can help it, above your hips. If you sit with your knees above your hips, it makes the energy and blood and air circulation in the torso especially more difficult. And that can kind of imbalance everything else. So adjust and move your legs to whatever is comfortable for you. Seems like it might be okay. You can change this as you go along. And then once you feel like they're something like how they might be good, then just let your legs be legs and forget about them. And now tune in to your spine from the base of your body to the crown of your head and let the crown of your head be as if there was a helium balloon attached right there and your body is like the string of that balloon. And so let it rise up, but feel the anchor and feel how that string is both anchored and floating into a, a gentle, pleasant form of traction, where you just feel a slight heaven and earth influence. And this will open up the chest, open up the diaphragm, open up the belly, but it's not an effortful action. It's like almost like a buoyant floating with an anchor at the bottom. And once you have something like that, just start to sway forward and back gently as if the wind or the breeze is pushing that balloon and then imagine that breeze stops and let the balloon find up just by feel find your natural up alignment and then once it feels like something like that is there rock left and right and same thing like a pendulum come to the natural center of the swing by feel 
and feel how throughout the meditation, this alignment will be like this. It's not tight. It's not rigid. It's like a balloon on a string. It's very, very, very swayable and easily changeable. Okay, now we'll just leave the spine like that. And the next thing we'll do is when we breathe in next, we're going to squeeze the hands really tight into fists. And when we breathe out, sigh and let the hands go limp. And feel that nice feeling of releasing that contraction. And then just put the hands however you like them close to your body. They can be palm down, palm up, in a mudra somehow, whatever is natural for you. Now we'll do the same with the shoulders. We're going to breathe in and let them come up to our ears, tighten them up, sigh, and drop them naturally. And feel how that's nice to release that. Now the area where the back of the neck meets the back of the skull, our sub occipital kind of area, we're going to scrunch that up. So just scrunch up your neck and then sigh and let it go and let the chin drop. And if we get to where maybe the eyes would be kind of on a downward angle, you'll feel the back of your neck where it meets the skull, those muscles open. We want to leave those natural and open. Now we'll do a big, exaggerated yawn. And when we breathe out, don't touch the teeth and don't make the tongue tight. Let them just be natural and soft as much as you can. And the final step is to raise the eyebrows up, scrunch the forehead, and then sigh and drop the whole face like a curtain. And now your eyes can be open, closed, or anywhere in between. Just follow what, by feel, seems like it's a good place to start. And you can always fix it in the mix of practice. So now we have a setup where we're in whatever position we're in, and we can forget about the legs. The spine has that heaven and earth, like balloon and anchor kind of feel to it. The hands we can forget about, the shoulders we can forget about, the back of the neck and the skull we can forget about, the jaw, the tongue we can forget about, the eyes we can forget about, the face. We can just leave them how they are. And this, whatever shape you're in right now, as we start to let ourselves settle into it, this is sort of our yoga posture. So for the duration of this practice, we're going to just settle and adjust in service of trying to remain in this specific posture where we've forgotten about the legs, the hands, the shoulders, etc. We just let the body be natural in this posture. Circulation can happen in this posture. Breathing can happen in this posture. It minimizes us needing to actually do anything except for let the body have some natural time. And as we let the body be like that, the mind is allowed to think or not think, to remember or not remember, to do anything it wants. This is not a control of the mind. We let the mind in the periphery kind of do anything it wants while we just experience this posture. And as the posture is being experienced, whenever we notice contraction or distraction where we've been lost, then we just see if there's any tension that can be let go of, and then either wriggle free from it or welcome that tension or relax it in any way that you might try and allow more settling into the posture. And then again, we might notice distraction or contraction at some point again, whenever that happens, whether it's a long time or immediately, we just release whatever can be let go of and then we just settle. So find your own rhythm, experiment and see how it goes and what happens. And I'll ring a bell when we're finished with this practice period.
And if at any point the practice gets confusing feeling, all we do is check our whole system anywhere we find contraction and let it go. And that's it. Whatever contraction remains, you couldn't let it go, that's fine. And then check again, is there contraction? If it's there, let it go. Whatever remains is fine. Whenever we notice a reaction or reactionary behavior arises in us, the first step is to check ourselves, not what we think is causing that. So we check, is there a contraction that doesn't have to be here? And if we find any, wish for it to be released or soften it.
if we ever get lost, sleepy, restless, daydreaming, anything like that, the moment we realize that happened, we've already woken up. It happens automatically. All we have to do is check for contraction in the system and then see if any of it can be released so that our being can run more smoothly and then leave it up to it to run itself.
And as the experience changes during practice, we don't have to try to have a goal. There's not calm or lack of thought or even being really relaxed. There's just releasing contraction while this is happening. So it could be releasing contraction while calm. It could be releasing contraction while bored. Releasing contraction while there's pain in the legs, etc. Even releasing contraction while adjusting our posture. It's fine for daydreams and thoughts and ideas and anything like that, mental activity to flow through the experience. We just release contraction as they do so.
sometimes we'll notice contraction somewhere in the experience. And it can also be helpful to release the contraction of feeling like something needs to be done about it. Just notice it's there and then wish for it to release naturally. But don't feel like you have to release it. You have to do it. Right. Let's stand up and do a little yin yang palms exercise. Get into our body a different way. And as we stand up, as we shift out of meditation, we just release contraction as we do it. Okay, so feet about shoulder width apart. Cup your hands so that all the fingers touch and the thumb is touching and then this pit of my palm right here. I'm going to bring my awareness there and feel the sensations in the pit of my palm and start with one hand up and one hand down. We're gonna start shaking the body, find a natural rhythm that feels nice to you. And any time that you notice tension in any joint or muscle that doesn't have to be there, just shake it out. You can sigh it out, And this is a, historically a, a Taoist health exercise. It's also a really good way to warm the body up in the morning or before you do something from the inside out. 
So as you shake, just release tension and feel those palms, feel the sensations on the palms. And keep shaking, but you can unlock the palms now and let them go down or up by feel. Just don't have a reason, just feel. Should it be down or up? What's more comfortable? And if you don't know, just try flip back between them and find out what seems to be right. And just like you adjust your body while you're sleeping, just adjust your body while you're shaking and feeling the palms. And don't have a reason why, just kind of do it and see if it's better, see if it's worse. And you'll find there are systems in your body that kind of know what to do for what you're feeling. Now I'm slowly shaking less and less and less, but I'm not stopping right away. I'm just getting tinier and tinier, and I'm feeling those palms. How do they like to be up or down? And let them be really freely changeable. Now my body is not shaking, but I feel vibration inside the energy of my body or under my skin. And I'm still just tuning into those yin yang palms. Do they want to be up or down? Releasing contraction, being easily changeable. Notice how we have that habit of bringing tension into the body, into the mind, even when we don't intend to. And just get really comfortable with noticing it, not being reactive about it, just, oh, there's some, doesn't have to be here, and just kind of let it evaporate or let it soften.
just release tension and see how does my behavior change when there's less contraction in the system? Do my motivations shift? Does what I pick to do change as I feel less contraction? So we'll start another practice in uh, just a couple minutes, but I just wanted to point to something. Uh, I've read at least one study that showed that if these were university-aged people, if they are given the option to sit in a room for, I think it was 12 minutes, it might have been longer, 12 to 25 minutes with no input, no one to talk to, no phone, or to be able to administer a mild electric shock to themselves <laughs> that a majority of people choose the shock. And um, that is a Buddhist concept, dukkha, but it's something we can actually find. We won't realize how pervasive it is until we look that the base nature of our experience when it's neutral is slightly less than neutral. And uh, if you just look at that, that, if you just don't do anything, for some reason, that's not good. It's not good enough. And that your mind starts to look for a distraction or a nice memory or a plan. How would you be different if when you didn't do anything, it was better than neutral? or even just neutral? What if it just didn't get bad? How would you change as a person over time? How would your motivation shift? How would your priorities shift? How would what you do and why you do it shift? And uh, much of the Buddhist material around behavior, the precepts and guidance for eating and sleeping and interacting with others and being generous and all of that, it's an excellent, an excellent description of how to be, but it's also an excellent description of how we would be if we just don't have that need to scratch an itch, that if we don't do it, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And so the root of that unsatisfactory feeling, that feeling of things just not being quite right, can be found in that contracting. And as we release it, eventually what's being released really probably is that need for things to not be beautiful and vivid and just how they are right now. So that's just something I'd like to plant the seed for if that's interesting for you. I had a few moments in that last sit where I, it, almost it felt similar to like when you're about to fall asleep I, I felt like my head like kind of like swaying a little bit but it was like i felt very awake like it wasn't it didn't feel the same as drifting into sleep but it was like um kind of it, it felt like kind of what you were talking about in terms of just letting letting things be like i felt like kind of alignment of like just letting all parts of my body be. And I'm, I guess I'm curious, like if you have a sense of like what, what that is, because as I was like re react, I was like noticing myself react to it. And it wasn't, there wasn't like a lot of contraction, but there was like, I was just kind of like in the rest phase and just trying to like enjoy it, but also not 
like holding on to it and it like yeah. would flicker for like a few seconds and that happened like a few times but i'm just curious i guess what if you have a sense of what that is yeah that's on the roadmap that uh I'm not going to set a goal so people feel like if I've had that or haven't, I'm somewhere before or higher or lower than that. But I'll say that that's in the territory. And um, when that happens, just release contraction. What I would describe that is, is uh, your mind knows what it's like for it to be naked. Your mind knows what it's like natural way is, but it hasn't been allowed to be that way very much. So it's very familiar with how we kind of make it be. But whenever we do give it like, here's, here's your room, you can do what you want for a while. It kind of like remembers its way back to how, what did I used to do when I had my own space and I kind of could just be however I am. And it remembers its way back to its true nature. And so that's a very common way that that happens. Um, in some practitioners of Zen in China and Korea, I don't know about Japan because I haven't focused as much on that stuff, but I know in those other countries, some people get to where that is so powerful that they don't sleep anymore. They just lay or get in a position and then it's that, and then they get up. And, uh, what that is, I, I don't want to name it. I just say it's part of it. And um, it's a good sign that you are getting out of the way enough that, that it can try to do some stuff that sometimes is kind of weird. Like it's like, oh, wow, what is this thing? I wouldn't have thought to do this. Um, I think it's similar in, uh, and again, I've only done a little bit of yoga, so I'm not a yoga expert or anything, but yoga nidra or that the end of a lot of yoga sessions where you'll lay in corpse pose and kind of just release, something like that can happen there. And I think that that is also another person found that in nature and is pointing to the same tree, you know, like, oh, check this thing out, it's kind of cool. Um, in craniosacral therapy, they call it the hypnagogic state and it's between sleep and awake. So sometimes you can hear yourself snore while you're in it and you'll twitch and stuff, but you're like, Somehow you're just watching it. And uh, that balance is in uh, Buddhism, samatha and vipassana or shamatha and vipassana. Uh, the relaxation, tranquilizing is the samatha and then vipassana is the curiosity or the ability to be clearly aware of what's happening. And basically that's what we're playing with. With our posture, that balloon spine, <clears throat> is a type of like awareness and alertness. And then the rest of it just kind of settling is the samatha, like the tranquilizing. You can also just do it mentally with like the releasing is the samatha. And then the seeing if there's anything that needs to be released or being curious is the vipassana. And you basically want them like an old time scale. You want to put them on in whatever order and then kind of balance them out. And then they go eh, like that. And then when they get like that, whenever it's pretty, aligned, it kind of raises its level and gets more sensitive and more clear and more powerful. And as that happens, it'll start to get like that. It'll get more and more where you're kind of almost like, I don't know if I'm asleep or not. And a lot of time, the instruction I give is that this process is a lot like taking a nap. It's kind of what you do when you take a nap. You just kind of do that, except for you don't lose interest. You like watch yourself take a nap almost. And you can hit this thing that's uh, the target. It's a very difficult, nice edge, like razor's edge between those two things. If you are too interested, you'll get tight and controlling. If you're too tranquilized, you'll get all foggy and dreamy. And in Chinese Buddhism, they call that the ghost cave on the dark side of the mountain where nothing ever happens in 10,000 years. <laughs> so it basically means, or they sometimes call it soaking a, walk, a rock in water. Like you pull it out 10,000 years later and it's a wet rock. It's not, it hasn't evolved, but it feels really nice. And it's one degree off sometimes from where you want to be. All you have to do is be a little more interested and it gets brighter. And then you just let it roll, let it be how it is. It sounds like you were kind of in the right zone. Let me see if I can draw a weird picture of that. 
I think I found this in a yoga teacher a long time ago, gave this image, but I find it really, it's, good. it's a good illustration. So, uh, and I'll try to show it to the camera as well. So it looks like this. It's kind of like flat ground with a chimney and there's a little wall that goes down below the ground. Let me hold that up here. And what this signifies is that this natural released experience we're trying to get to, if you walk on the ground you normally exist on, you'll just run into a wall. You'll try to release and then it'll be like, this doesn't work. The world makes you tighten up or you have to, to cope with things or to handle emotion or whatever. So what we have to do is we're up here. We have to relax until we sink under the ground a little bit. And this part is sleepy. It's almost asleep. You get very, very soft and relaxed and kind of foggy. And if you don't, uh, if you don't have interest, you'll kind of drift down and you'll never go up this chimney. But if you have enough interest, you get under the wall that's there. And as soon as you're under it, you go boom, 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 like that. And you just get more and more present, more and more clear. And you can only reach that thing by going under it. If you try to go up to it, the wall is like infinitely high. You'll just run into it. By, and that's by trying. By trying to do it, by being, I'm going to do this. I want it so bad. I'm interested. And that's why I think in a lot of spiritual traditions, you'll hear an instruction that enlightenment is the end of the seeking mind. And that, that doesn't mean you were already enlightened before you knew to want it. It means that when you're seeking, you stay above ground. And so you get to the spot, but there's no door there. You just, and the harder you push, it's like a magic spell. You push this hard, it resists you this hard. You push this hard, it resists you that hard. So you have to just go like that. And then it's easy. Jason, I've talked to you before about like, when, and you mentioned it before, when I notice my breathing, like it makes it hard to breathe, which is, yeah. there's like less tension around that. But I'm noticing the same thing with the first R that like, as soon as I realize um, that I've been distracted or whatever, that the thoughts stop. So like, I'm wondering if the picture that you just drew, drew like if I'm not relaxing enough, you know, like if I'm as soon as I see it, I just, I don't know what's going on, but I can't, I can't watch thoughts. I can't be with shots, thoughts. As soon as I turn my attention to them or I realize them, they stop. Oh, that's not a problem. That just feels like a problem. Uh, okay. <laughs> I teach a group of people to get your thoughts to stop. We will have a very busy minded retreat. So if I say you're allowed to think whenever you want and just watch what, watch them go by. Uh, my first Zen teacher described it like, someone keeps pushing a line of balloons in front of you and you just, every time you look at them, they pop. But if I tell you to pop them, they get like armored. They become like armored balloons and they won't pop. So that's what happens. If we want them to pop, we want to stop that, it will not stop. But if we let it, let it have permission to do its thing, its lifetime is super short. And it just being known, sometimes that's what the thought needed was just to be known it existed. And as soon as it's known, we didn't have to act upon it. It just has to be known. As soon as it's known, it like unravels. It's like an Alka-Seltzer. It just kind of fizzes until there's nothing there. So that that's natural, but I can't, and remember that all of you, you can't tell or motivate yourself with thought stopping because the mind's natural function is to produce thought when it's appropriate. So if you stop it, 
it will start getting a workout from that resistance and will get stronger and stronger at making them. But if you say you can do it whenever you want, as much as you want, it doesn't want to do it all the time. My low back just, I kept adjusting because I was having low back pain. And I finally just said to myself, why don't you get a little, small little pillow and just put it in the small of your yeah. back and what a relief because now I can just sit. I'm not in pain. I'm not resisting the pain. I'm not constantly looking for better comfort. I can notice tension and I can stay right there because I know it's going to release it's not going to intensify and if it does my body will tell me and then i'll know i need to change so it's like the whole practice shifted and i'm so grateful thank you good thank you yeah sometimes we become aware of tension by amplifying creating it until we are forced to realize it and um if you look at what you described, the act of continually looking for tension requires effort, which creates tension. If you just have to sustain effort for a long time, you get tight. So you look, 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 and that's what I mean by it's self-correcting and that you don't have to, insights through this type of practice are not thoughts. They're after the fact, it's like a realization of something you just experience. It's just like learning how to swim. You just kind of keep changing and it works better. And eventually you have a thought about it. Oh, I think I cup my hands more or whatever it is that you do. So you don't arrive there by thinking. You just do it. And by releasing, you get clear enough that things that we had amnesia around or we were numb to, they start to surface. And then you realize there's a new thing to work with, which is why I just say it's releasing contraction while blank, fill in the blank. Because yesterday's practice was right for you. That's how it was yesterday. You're releasing contraction as you knew how to then. And now you're releasing contraction as you know how to now. And you couldn't get to now without having done then. So there is no ideal there's just it's a it's a flow and that flow deepens um, so i've noticed this in like a longer meditation i did a few weeks ago and this one where like the first sit it was like i get really calm less thoughts and then the second one i get a lot more like thoughts coming at me is that common? I don't know. Just just had that experience multiple times, and I don't know if you've there anything to comment on that. Is that common? Yes, it happens to people. Is that the majority way that people experience meditation? There is no majority way people experience meditation. Okay. We all have our own karma, genetics, cultural conditioning, ideas of we got from school, from our family, and all that, and they make such a different way that we think how things should work that like. There is no common way, but I can say there's a, it's not, you're not the only person that's ever said that to me. And I've experienced that. What you want to do is do it so often that you start to have an idea of why. Right. It's like I take a hike every single day and I pack my lunch up there. And sometimes I'm nauseous when I get there and I don't feel like eating my lunch. And you just keep doing it until you realize why. If I don't eat breakfast, I get nauseous or maybe I'm pushing myself too hard on this one part or mm. I keep drinking water out of this stream that I think is healthy for me and maybe it's not. Or, <laughs> but like you just kind of through a process of elimination, you just arrive at it. And that that kind of wisdom, no one can talk you out of it. They can just kind of posit other ideas, mm. but you, it's really experiential. Okay. Get curious. Yeah, be, be curious. The real balance is tranquilized, mm. curious tranquilizing reactivity so that it can't just fire off right and curious what's happening what impulses are coming up what do i want to do why and then naturally a type of learning happens through osmosis just by being exposed to that that you don't have to try to do you'll just understand it's just like if you were forced to help your grandma cook twice a day 
whether you like cooking or not, you'll kind of know how she did her recipes after a while. You just kind of are around it, right? You just kind of just do it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I have two questions. I think the first one was uh, had a similar experience where I guess that will, it seems like uh, there's a very strong sense of like, I need to find uh, contractions, especially in the place where it's resting. So there's resting happening and then there's like, let me try and control the situation by finding stuff. Uh, and um, I was just wondering, are there, like you were talking about shamatha and then sort of like, you know, developing Vipassana after that, I guess one, brainstorm I had was maybe I can do, uh, you know, a bit more loving kindness before doing it because it feels very um, like seeker-ish, like sort of like I want to get somewhere and sort of like seeing in that space of just like experience as this thing that wants to do something. And even though there's no tension, it's still trying to find stuff. So I'm just wondering, um, yeah, and I think it's kind of related to too much energy as well. I feel like there's just like a lot of energy and a lot of like clarity, but still it doesn't feel calm, I guess. That's a good thing to notice. And there's a relationship between energy and how powerful impulse wants to move us. And the more clear we are, the more unfettered we are, the more energy there is. And things that wouldn't have moved, up, moved us get stronger and now they want to move you. And so you have, it's a training. That's how it teaches us. We think we're free from something and then a stronger version of it comes up and now you're not free and you have to learn how to release that. And then you're free from it and it lets a stronger version until maybe there isn't a strong enough one to move you anymore. That's how it builds. Um, for anyone who's dealing with that, like Robin kind of described that too, the seeking, if you feel that, Try this, when you sit down, wish into your mind three times if you want to, just say it in your mind, please, whenever contraction is noticed, just notice it. Ask it to do it. And then just sit there. Don't do meditation, let that, let that thing do the meditation. And then whenever you notice it, see if there's anything to release, that's when you're on, your chance. Release what, like notice whatever it is, see if you can release it or ask it to be released, and then now turn it back over. It's not your job to find it. That's important for you to know. It's not your job to find it. That happens automatically by something that's like your roommate. Your roommate finds it. Your roommate says, hey, the, the living room is a little messy. Do you know why? Like that. It comes to you. You don't want to go out and keep checking. That's not your job in this dynamic. So let realizing happen, even if it never happens, be okay, that was a good session. Because it, if you take the job away, the thing that's gonna realize for you is shy. It will let you have the job. But it wants work, it wants to do something. That's its natural function. So wish for it, like I'm gonna try really hard to not mess with stuff. Please just let's know when something is contracted and then see what happens. So just to clarify, like in this state, um, in the resting state, even though you're seeing everything and you also notice contractions, but they happen in the space of everything else, it's okay for them to happen and for things to get kind of contracted and you seeing it without reacting to it. Yes. Um, there's just like this binary threshold where you realize and at that point you can do work. You, you don't do the work still. There's a binary threshold where you finally realize it's there. But all we do is we, we use the senses. We basically experience the senses without losing them. We, we don't get into a fog or something. As long as the senses are being experienced, the thing that's going to deal with the contraction will know about it and it will deal with it. You just need to not, you need to monitor the function of the senses to see that they're allowing stuff to come in. If you start to get focused on something or just like in a fog or whatever, then that thing won't 
know to do anything about the contraction because it won't know it's there or anything. So as long as we just basically get out of the way and wait for realizing to happen, and when it happens, if we focus on that and start ruminating about it, that thing doesn't have a bunch of sensory feed to like fix the problem. You have to just kind of feel like you said within the whole of what's happening. There's some contraction here. This all feels like this. And then you just present that problem to it. Here, you do something about it. And it does. Thanks. Yeah, I know it's, I know it's weird and hard to get because we don't really have language for this, especially in English, but um, it is not that hard to experience. And again, if somebody shoves you while you're standing and you catch yourself, that, that was it. The same thing, it auto resolves your posture the best it can. You didn't have to think about that first or prepare for it or anything. It just does that. It's the same thing when Instead of a shove, it's just realizing there's tension there, and then it, it does its thing. I'm wondering about the hungry ghost cave, and a lot of times, like, after a sit, it, I, it's challenging for me to report. It feels like it was a blur, mm -hmm. and I wonder the how you know the difference between being in the hungry ghost cave or it being a like a productive set. Okay. Um, I, you add hungry to that. I don't say hungry. Uh, I just say the ghost cave, but um, how do you know? It's, it's a very near miss. So it's not bad to be there. It's bad to think that's how it's supposed to be. Like bad is even not a great word, but it doesn't work well to think that's the point of the practice. So when you're there, you need to just be interested in what's happening. And uh, afterwards, what you're describing, another way of describing what this practice does is it ends the habitual discriminating behavior of the mind, where uh, the mind wants to chop everything into little buckets and say, like we call all of those out there trees, but if you actually sit them next to each other, they're not the same thing. They're not like a copy paste of each other, right? But tree is a good way to like group it as long as you're gonna look at what it actually is. But our mind likes to use the grouping and forget what it actually is. So we say Democrats and Republicans and men and women and old and young and alive and dead and all that. But some people dying is tragic. Some people dying is relief, right? Like to say that that's the same thing, it's not. And so we're ending that not on purpose, like with will, but we're realizing that's an extra heads up display the mind puts over your reality. It kind of adds that. And so when we relax enough, it automatically ceases and that's called the extinction or cessation of the discriminating mind, which we find out most of us identify as the discriminating mind. That is me. That's, that's why, what kind of person I am. That's what I like to do. Uh, and we find out that that is not me. It is a guest, whatever I am, it comes and goes from my experience. And then what am I is a neat question to ask when we start to look at that. If I'm not that, what am I like? And uh, if I told you to end the discriminating mind, we would have a very busy-minded retreat. It's, it's very difficult to do that. But through relaxation, we find that it's actually an upkeep to keep that thing running. It takes energy that we may not want to spend. And so when you practice skillfully, to some degree, it ends. And a lot of times, there's no fanfare that it ends. You know when I ask someone to talk about it, and that thing isn't making words for everything and narrating everything and stuff. And you're like, Ugh, you're like, it was kind of nice not talking about it. So you should look if it's that or if you are blissing out away from experience, just examine how, how all encompassing is the knowing 
versus was it an absorption into a dreamlike thing where most of what was happening in the room and everything else was not known. And that tells you the ghost cave is the absorption into it. It, it could also be called being attached to absorbing into emptiness, like trying to get in there. And the non ghost cave is to just know what's happening really clearly. But it doesn't mean you'll have lots of words. And again, the six patriarch and Zen, I quote, uh, Hui Nung was their name. I quote them a lot because uh, if you read the Platform Sutra, it's a pretty profound, very clear pointing at the, how to do this kind of work. And um, one quote from Hui Nung is, originally there is no thing. And that means, or we could say originally there are no things. That means a baby just looks around and it just sees what it sees and it hears what it hears, but there's no delineation of that was a giraffe and that's a light and that's not a light. And it doesn't know to do that yet. It's just coming in and experiencing it. And that's actually still how it is, but we're taught vocabulary and language and all that, which is very helpful but a dog probably doesn't know that it's called a dog and it doesn't feel bad if it's called a dag instead of a dog, <laughs> like, uh, because that's not its defining characteristic of its experience, right? And it doesn't know that when it does its sound, that's called a bark or arf or woof woof or rough. That's, we put that on there, right? And then we think that is with reality, that's what reality is. But uh, when we relax enough, we realize, whoops, I've kind of been projecting something on there. And so when it goes away, you have to kind of do that yourself. You have to see, it's very common the way I teach when I ask for questions, no one wants to talk for about five or 10 minutes. Like, and that's usually because to some degree that thing has pacified and you've realized it's natural, it's okay. Like if you go on a long walk by yourself in the woods or something, you may stop using words. You just kind of, you're just doing it, right? You don't need it. Uh, but for some reason we want to like, or maybe we don't even want to, but a narrator starts talking about everything. Oh, that was stupid. You just slipped on that thing. Look at that thing. That's cool. Man, people are messing this place up. Like it's just, <laughs> it's like a, an NFL game or something, like some sports game. There's like the people telling you what you're watching. You're like, I freaking see it, you know? Like, <laughs> So that, we don't have to do that, it's an extra thing, but we don't know how to relax it. So when we just relax contraction, it blanket in its own order, it releases all these little extra ornaments that are on the tree until you can just feel your tree, your natural being. So just see, and then let me know. Okay. So on my sits right now, I feel like what I would say is happening is kind of like my heart is dreaming. There's like a lot of kind of moving through like stuff from other parts or just like emotional stuff. And I'm looking for a contraction there. And I was playing with forgiveness as a way to kind of, to release contraction sure. of the heart. But I wanted to kind of check in with you about if it's too much doing or if, if it's good. Can you forgive while releasing contraction? Like release contraction tied to forgiving. Huh. See if there's any extra in there. Like whatever you do, just release anything that doesn't have to be there. Yeah. As you do it and see what the natural act of forgiving and more natural act is like. Huh. Because our sometimes I think especially uh Lin Chi, Chan or, or Rinzai Zen. Rinzai sometimes, if, if I remember, I think it was him, he spoke about essence and function. Um, I know that's definitely an old Zen that was a way of talking and I use it a lot. So we have to learn that our natural mind has an essence and a function. And there's not really two different things, but it's easy to think one of them is everything. And so the essence is it doesn't have to spend energy to know what's happening. It just knows. If you just get out of the way, you'll just know what's happening. And then the function is 
Xeron. Like it has a natural response that also doesn't take any effort. Like getting annoyed doesn't take, you don't think to get annoyed with <laughs> sevens, right? But it also has skillful response like that, that you don't think it just comes up, like enjoying something nice, you just, it just happens. So all of the things that we do are the, they're, they're incited by or they originally emerge from the function. But then we can attach a bunch of weights on that function when it comes mm -hmm. out and try to control it. And that gets very artificial. It's all function, but it's mm -hmm. just ignorant function. It's like the function not knowing what the function is doing. So it's trying to fix the function. Mm -hmm. And it gets real parasitic and kind of just filled with a bunch of extra stuff. So that's called ignorance in Buddhism or delusion. So if you just look at it, that's one way to work with ignorance. Another is release any extra, but explore doing it. If it feels like it's going to happen, let it happen. Don't stop it because the function's trying to do something. But kind of let it do it in a smoother way, in an easier way. Mm. Until it, and if you ro remove too much, it won't be able to do it. It'll be like, I need some of that energy. You'll feel that too. Then like, oh, okay, sorry. Mm. And they'll take more. But let your natural function just kind of be like waves on a lake. Like sometimes the lake's calm and then it starts to get ripply and then it, and you don't have to like control the waves or flatten them down or anything. Uh. Um, yeah, a couple of things. Uh, one that happened this early this morning while I was up um, and it, just another just during the, the sit that I thought was kind of amusing, but um, but both things pointed me in a direction that I thought was interesting. So I wanted to share um, the thing that during the sit that I just thought was amusing was, um, you know how sometimes, well, for me, I sometimes get have a sneeze coming on, but I can, I know it's coming on, right? Like I can feel, oh, this, it's like a contraction, right? So I could sense a sneeze coming on. And I don't usually like sneezing. So sometimes I start going into a story about the, oh, I sneeze. But instead, so I dropped, I didn't go into the storytelling about it. And I just, all of a sudden, I was sort of like watching the sneeze as if I was looking at my own sinus passages or something. And I could see things like firing off. Like it was weird. It was just kind of a sensation. I was just, but I just had this open kind of curiosity about it. And I just watched it. And then it just sort of, Eh, went away. So I thought that was kind of funny, but it ties into also what was more kind of a bigger thing that I, I experienced this morning, which was um, for all week, I've been trying to create a report for my my job and it's just been fighting me and, and the data is just not coming together. It's just all kinds of data errors and things like that. And for some reason this morning around 630, I just thought, you know, what if? And I just popped onto my computer and I started poking around in the report that I'd already built and it wasn't wasn't working the way it was supposed to. And I realized that this morning I was like, huh, this whole week I've been fighting this report and I've been going, God, the data should be there. It should be able to, I should be able to get it. And this is making my job hard and I like can't accomplish what I want to accomplish. So I was telling a lot of stories around it. And so this morning instead, I just like let all of that go. And I just thought, what if, what if I click on this? What if I do this? What if I do? Awesome. And it take two hours, but I nailed it. I got my report. So I was just... I was, it was just that storytelling, yeah, thanks. <laughs> but I realized that storytelling is that really that eye making, right? Is so much of the tension, the thinking and the kind of creative, open curiosity, there, there's really no tension in that. There's thinking, but it's not like a tension. It's so it's very, um, so it has a flow to it. So that was- yeah. Kind of what I was really noticing this morning and, and during the set too, but yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds like you surrendered it over in some way to Zeron and then Zeron or what naturally would arise if you stopped taking the microphone away, got to just kind of, and it sorts things out in a way that will drive people insane. Like if someone needs you to have a plan that they can write down, they'll be like, this is never going to work. But like <laughs> Noam and I last night, we, 
we walked to a park after practice and then we were like, should we get some food? And we both decided it was fine to just walk and see if we decided to do something. And then if we thought of something on the way, we would try that. And we did that and we ended up at an awesome place that neither of us has ever been to and we ate there and it was great. And that's the same thing. You just kind of, I love how you did it with inquiry because sometimes we can't quite let it just happen. So you can, the doing can be to, to ask, like, I'm going to not do this right now. Do you want to do something like that? You can kind of say, where should I click? What should I do then? Right. And that uh, in Korean Zen, at least that's called don't know mind. So you put yourself in don't know, but don't know is how you are when you really want to learn something. Right? Like if you walk into a, a thing you really want to do, you get very don't know. You're like, what's going on here? What do I do? What are people doing? Like you kind of look at everything and you just take in, you allow it to all come in. And from there, that massive amount of information, our natural function, Xeron, knows how to handle that massive amount of information and do really cool things with it that the conscious mind would be pretty exhausted by. So, awesome. I realized why I like your teaching so much during this retreat. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. <laughs> so there's this thing called counter will, which is like, uh, if someone tells you to do something, you uh, at least I feel it quite strongly. Instantly, a reaction is not to do it because just to be contrary to that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, uh, it's I just have always felt it my whole life. Sometimes my like when I was a teenager, it was really strong. Like my sister would be driving or would be giving me directions as I'm driving, and she'd be like, "Turn right here," and I'd be like, "You can't." Tell and make the wrong turn <laughs> because I didn't want to be controlled by my sister. <laughs> so dumb. But um, anyway, still have a little bit of that teaching along. And I feel like all of your teachings are so allowing the natural unfolding of things, which is, I think, the, some part of the counter will, like, is trusting that there's a natural unfolding that doesn't need to be guided. And then you're like you just dodge it all the time with, you know, and I'm like, oh, should I? Yeah, you know, you, it's so gentle and it's so um, trusting of the natural process. And I think that is like what makes me like it so much. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's neat to have words for that. I've never had words for that. But um, a lot of that comes from my history, which most people here don't know, but um, I left home when I was 16, and I was one of the most ADHD people I've ever met. And um, I had, there wasn't really, a, that wasn't common language. It was called ADD, but not ADHD yet. And uh, even medicating it wasn't really happening yet when that happened. And so... I knew I operated really differently than other people. And uh, I really tried to like fix it and there was no way. And part of that is a defining characteristic I've kind of realized for a lot of people with ADD or ADHD is very strong will and impulse. Uh, and a lot of it is because there's really strong energy. Their mind goes really fast or it goes all over the place because there's a lot of energy and not enough outlet. So it's like, whatever you do, it's like, oh, 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 and, that. and it's just kind of doing that. And so impulse, whenever someone says concentrate, or you need to help me do this, or you need to drop that or whatever, you have to use a massive amount of energy to like wield your mind to try to do it. And so it gets very, very strong. Your impulse gets way stronger than a normal person. And if you look at, if you have ADHD or know someone who has it a lot of times, their impulse is very strong and their impulse control is quite weak. It's like, if you want to lose your temper, you lose it easier and you lose it bigger. Or if you want to do something, you have a very strong counter will. Not that I'm saying you have it. All of us have all of these little knobs and sliders, but to different levels. And so uh, I realized I have a very powerful mind. That's my experience of my trying to resist my own mind. It's very powerful. And whenever I would push on it 
or try to control it. I grew up around the Bible, so I'll use a Bible simile. I'm sorry if you don't like them. I'm not trying to push it on you or anything. But um, in the Bible, there's the story of Samson. And Samson is really strong. And at the end of that story, he he's blind. And he, uh, he puts his hands on pillars or walls of this building. And then he's able to push against it so hard that it collapses. And I found that exact thing seemed to happen in my mind. Whenever I would suppress or repress or control, I would put a box on that thing and it immediately put its hands on it. And then I would hold that box and it would start shoving against it. And eventually it would get so strong, boom, the box would fall and then the impulse would come out. And I would lose my temper or act in some way I didn't like or whatever. And I think psychology seems to talk about that too, like suppressing, repressing probably doesn't work that well. But especially if you have a strong will, you give it a workout every time you do that. So I realized, I think from Taoism and martial arts that like the strong opponent, you never want to let them use their strength. So what do you do? If, if you're really strong and violent, I wanna like levitate you about eight feet up off the ground and watch you just go like this and not, touch you. I don't want to fight you. I'm just going to watch you until you get tired. And so that's basically what we're doing in our mind is whatever it is that wants to fight or get tight, I'm not going to try to beat you. I'm just going to like let you do that until you get tired and never give you a reason to get tight in response to me. I'm going to just like soothe, soothe, soothe. And without an audience or without a reason, eventually the motivation to be strong or be resistant weakens. And that's a teaching of the Buddha is uh, feed what is skillful, starve what is not. That's the way we change ourselves. So you can, if nothing else from this whole weekend, just remember that in your life, whenever something seems useful, whether you're good at it or not, feed it, it will get stronger. If it's not useful, starve it and it will get weaker. The whole world works like a plant. You water it, you give it sun, it grows that where the nutrient is. When it's starved, it withers. And that's how you operate. You just kind of realize, even a toxic person, you feed it, it grows. You starve it over time, it withers. It takes more and more of their energy to maintain it if you don't feed it. And then eventually, the them thinking about being toxic to you or interacting with you will wither. And it's not an act of anger to do something like that or, or resentment or anything. It's wisdom. It's just... Feed what's skillful, start what's not. Feed what's skillful, start what's not. And let your definition of skillful and what's not evolve. Sometimes what's unskillful for us at one place, when we're, if we have a higher capacity, it is skillful for us to interact with it. So for instance, when I left home, I didn't interact with my parents for five years at all. Like I wanted them to think I was dead. But I'm friends with my parents now. And that was not immediately. That was when my capacity shifted and the power dynamic felt like it shifted, I could wade in and kind of see, does it still do what it did? And when it didn't, I realized, oh, then me acting this other way is actually giving them power over my behavior. What if I just like be natural? And, uh, You'll notice as you work with this that the, the human perception of time is kind of funny. Uh, the idea that we divide our time into minutes, for example, one minute right before your execution, as you're waiting for it, will be a very different length of time and feeling than one minute right before you get off work. And uh, one minute when you're bored sometimes crawls and one minute while you're having a lot of fun sometimes blinks by. And uh, releasing contraction lets us also experience time in a variable way. Until you may kind of think of time as just a funny word. Um, time does pass, I mean, things change, but uh, it's not the same for everyone. It's not the same for every being involved in it, and it's not the same for us each time we experience it. And so also with all the other stuff, as we loosen up, 
all the kind of hard buckets we've had for putting things in or hard ideas of how things work, they start to get very fluid. But that does not mean we lose our ability to function. We actually get better at functioning because when the label is useful, we can use it. And as soon as it's not, we can drop it. <clears throat> I think I have something in here about Budai. Even if I don't, that just came up, so I'm probably going to teach it anyways. Um, what this does, as we soften, is we can start to live life as a question. And I really, really can't stress enough, try that. Uh, instead of thinking, I am going to blank, whatever it is, start doing it and think of it as, I wonder how... I'm going to do blank. I wonder if I'm going to do blank. And every part of it keeps that. And sometimes you'll notice you just did whatever it was. It's completed. Oh, wow. But each step you weren't positive how it was going to happen or if it's going to happen or when. And that don't know quality gets very relaxing and very interesting. And that's exactly the thing we're balancing here is interest and relaxation. So. Uh, when you hold things as I don't know, it doesn't mean you can't ever, if someone says, are you going to come to my house tomorrow to the party? You don't say, I don't know if I'm going to even get dressed. Don't say that to people. <laughs> but you can feel that way inside because it's awesome to find out somehow you got dressed and made it over there at whatever time you did. And you weren't positive the whole way, but somehow life dropped those pieces and you, you walked on them until you were there. And it gets really neat to do even the most boring stuff. Because it's just like uh, in Chan, they say, a wondrous display. It's just a, amazing how weirdly things unfold. And when we control them, a lot of the mystery or excitement of that disappears because we feel like I did it. Or when I don't feel like I did it, it's pretty amazing it happens. Uh, one place that that happens all the time is memory. Like, is something going to come up? You know, we can say, I want to remember that, but usually we have no idea if we're going to remember it. You just hope so, and then you try to write it down or whatever to, like, help that happen. But isn't it amazing that somehow you remember things sometimes and other times you don't and that it's actually not up to you? It's kind of amazing anything gets done because of that. It's kind of amazing that uh, so many things happen because of that weird spontaneous arising or not arising of phenomena in our experience. Uh, it's amazing our heart beats the next beat. It's amazing when it doesn't. It's amazing when you almost get in a car accident and you don't. It's amazing when you do. The other day I just took a left at a light. It was a double lane left and the guy had a new sports car and it just rained and he floored it and halfway through the turn, he spun out and he hit my Jeep. And the whole time, I was like, whoa. <laughs> I was watching, I was like, whoa. I could feel the road, and I didn't break loose. And he could, and he did. And he got out, and he's like, I just got this car. I guess it's, I didn't know that could even happen. And all that was just this big, spontaneous thing. And somehow, we shared our information, and he didn't lie about it, and I didn't, and I got the clearance to like fix my vehicle and no one got hurt and everything was genuine in that interaction it was super cool and he actually wrote me afterwards and was like thank you so much for you know kind of working with things and and I said thank you for letting me fix my vehicle like that actually helps me a lot and uh, I'll pay that forward to someone else someday you know so oh, but I didn't think to say that either I don't know why I arrived at that memory. It's just from what I was saying. That's Ziran. It just comes up. And if I'm contracted, I would have thought, why would I say that? And then I'd be saying something else right now. So there's a mode through life that is planned and rigid. And there's a mode through life that is spontaneous. And they can play together. You can be spontaneous and then plan when you need to. And then release from there and see where it goes. And uh, it's really beautiful and unentangled. So live life as a question. I wonder if I'm going to do that. 
instead of I am going to do that. I guess not. <laughs> Release contraction, then see what happens and how it goes. That's another, like, I wonder. I wonder if the contraction is going to release. I wonder what it's going to be like. And then see. When we find something to do, this is a weird way to integrate this. But when you find something to do, just do it. Start it. And then as soon as you start it, release the plan of what's next and see how it's going to continue or how it's going to fall apart. And just do your best until you don't want to do it or it's done. And uh, my mentor in Korea, Ayesu Chita, she actually said that's, she recommended that's how you do your whole day, is you pick one thing that's kind of in the middle at the end of your day, you aim at that, and then you remember all the other stuff you kind of have to do, and however you can, you just weave it in until you get to that, and then you pick one more thing. I'm going to go to bed at 10, and then you just kind of, whatever I got to do, somehow I'm going to fit it in, and you just start making an art out of that and letting it just kind of Tetris its way in, it just kind of fits in. Start something and adjust it in the mix while continually observing how it's going. That's the training of natural function. So natural function brings up spontaneously what to do, what I feel like, etc. But it's not all knowing. It's based off what's already, it's been allowed to learn. That's my way of explaining it. It's not so simple as that, but it is to learn it. Just think of it as it needs training, and to get training, it has to have exposure. So you have to give it a chance. So give it a chance with stuff that you don't care if it goes perfect. Like try brushing your teeth and do it by feel. Work in a place of your mouth till you feel like you should go somewhere else. And then if you feel like brushing your teeth for one second, look how you feel an hour later. Was that enough? And let that also inform it the next time you do it by feel. And you'll start to just find this kind of natural thing. I don't know how to explain it better than that. Um, I can say when I was younger, uh, I was training for the Olympics. And I was really athletically minded. And uh, a side thing I did just to keep in shape was run. I never actually even liked running, but I ran a lot. And one day, my wife was working out at a place for her firefighter exam. And they were, the person was like a track coach or something. And I got there and I, to pick her up. And he said, oh, she's out running like a four-mile course or something right now. Uh, and I said, oh, I'll go catch her. And he was like, no, she left like, you know, a while ago. And I said, oh, I'll see if I can catch her. And I was just wearing like jeans and like a hot shirt or something. It was a day like today. It was pretty hot. And I just went out and like just boom, 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 boom. And then I ran in right with her. And he he timed me and he was like, that's almost like an Olympic running time. And I was like, cool. But <laughs> I don't run. You know, I'm not a runner and I don't like it. Uh, but that's what I mean is I've found <laughs> accidentally several times this thing can, as long as you never start thinking, you don't know how to do it or you're not doing it right, you can actually get amazing at something. You can be an amazing chef and not think of yourself as a cook. You can be an amazing parent and not hold the role of a parent in your mind. Just try to be responsive and good and uh, all the time, including some people here, I interact, I interact with people and their day-to-day -day wisdom of just how they do things strikes me as like I've never read it in a book and I did not know to think that way I've never even tried it that way so if we release we start being able to take information even from sources that are not a source we would normally take stuff from and I can't say enough how many times some wisdom has been presented to a group of people while I've been around but let's just say the presenter, for instance, has an annoying voice or has a really like annoying attitude. And so people literally take nothing of what's said. They just can't receive. 
And I have found most of my best information sometimes from people that were trying to prove me wrong. But they say, you know, this, you, it doesn't work that way. It works this way. And I'll be like, does it? I go find out. Like, uh, but if I hardened against it, I absolutely can't receive it. And I can't do anything with it. So this is like a whole different way to receive and go through life. Uh, and it becomes personal. Uh, another part of that is that when we feel preference, we should begin to check if there's contraction there with preference. Because preference is a really hard word to describe. Uh, there is wise preference, which comes from knowing what's a good fit. And there's also I want it preference, which usually is not a good fit. It's actually the definition of it is it's not happening how I want it. And so uh, learning how to peel those apart and live from it's a good fit instead of I want to make sure this happens is very powerful. And uh, you'll find most of the same stuff can happen sometimes better if you learn that art of timing. And I wonder if the opportunity is going to happen. And sometimes, let's say you want to say something and you're waiting for that opportunity and it doesn't come up, later you'll realize if I had said that, it wasn't really relevant to the conversation. Like I was kind of forcing this thing in there or it didn't belong. So is preference always the wisest motivation? That's something to look at. Do we really need to do things primarily because of preference? That's a powerful thing to look at. Uh, should I act nice because I feel like being nice? What about if you have a kid and you're in a bad mood, should you act not nice to them because you don't feel nice? Like, just think about that. And how many other places in life is there a spot where the right thing is not how we feel? But our actions are our belongings. So when we act, we can, for instance, do a loving act because we feel loving. We can also do a loving act because we absolutely do not feel that way, and we offer it anyways. And that uh, I heard Thich Nhat Hanh call that love as a choice instead of love as an emotion. Uh, I think both of those are really neat to look into and related to this. Uh, what if what I did was by determining if something seems like a good fit and feels right? Uh, that is my definition of bodhicitta, which is the mind of awakening. And it's basically the motivation that leads to enlightenment. Uh, if we operate that way, looking at a situation, what seems like the best fit, and then making an art out of learning how to kind of drop the right thing in there, uh, that becomes a wonderful way to go through life. And you'll find there's still room for your personality in that. There's still room for you to be whoever you seem to be and also to change and maybe even go back if you don't want to be that way and all that. And uh, it just kind of magically works out. Are we willing to make mistakes, learn from them, improve, and try again? That's what this practice really, at its root, happens. We keep trying to release, and sometimes it's a mistake. We aren't, we aren't able to release anything, or we do it wrong, like some people have said today. I feel like I did it wrong, or I was trying. Or, but that's exactly how you learn. It's a process of elimination. And by hating the elimination process, you can't go through it. Uh, and Rumi... Uh, who's a Sufi poet, uh, there's a part of one of his poems where he said, how are you to become polished if you are bothered by every rub? And that's a really wise thing. Man, I hated being rubbed for a long time. I just hated it. and But I wanted to be polished. And then I was like, eventually they connected. I realized, oh, you have to polish the tarnish off. And if you hate that process, you hate being corrected, you hate being wrong, you're just going to kind of hate that you have to be tarnished. So the more we can embrace trying, failing, learning, trying, failing, learning, trying, succeeding, learning, trying, failing, learning, the ratio of success and failure will change. And that type of wisdom, that type of understanding,
cannot be taken from us. It can't be talked out of us once we really have it. It's experiential and it's powerful. Uh, another part is uh, in the Sharangama Sutra, it talks about a magical cloth that has six knots tied in it. And those six knots stand for the six senses. Five senses, and the sixth one is our experience of mental experience. And then it says, the reason the cloth is magical is that when one of those six knots is untied, they all untie together. And that means if we can release the entangled way of using one of our senses, the other five senses will undo. And so I've been teaching a way that primarily focuses on releasing the body. And if your body releases, you will find your hearing releases and your mind releases and your reactivity across the board will shift. Uh, but you can also do that by looking at something. One really good way to do that is to go out and watch an entire tree for a long period of time and take it in without focusing. Just let it move and not move and relax anything that gets tight while you do that. And uh, it can unentangle the senses. You can listen to uh, something. I recommend starting with like rain or put on a long YouTube video of forest sounds or something. And just release. Don't try to hear, just let it come in. Release anything that gets tight. And your whole system will open up in its own way. Eventually, uh, I've done that practice with uh, CT scan, sitting in there for like seven hours. Just hearing it wham, 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 and just releasing as it happens, and it's super powerful. Uh, that's the the Dharma door of Avalokiteshvara Guanyin, is to release through hearing. So uh, that name Avalokiteshvara means perceiver of the world's woes, and or hearer of the world's woes. So it kind of uh, implies part of the way that being awakened was through hearing. Uh, so anyways, that's the dharma I have behind this. Uh, that The Shangama Sutra is awesome. If you ever want to read it, just look it up. It is pretty thick. It's a book about that thick. Uh, but it's pretty mind-bending. It talks about atoms and other kinds of things. And it was written, you know, maybe 1,700 to 2,000 years ago. Uh, it's pretty fascinating. The other thing I'd like to say before we go into practice is I have built a simple system. It's not my system. There are other systems like it. Uh, just how I'm presenting it is specific to how I word it or whatever. Uh, but I try to come up with something that's simple to present to people and that you can take into the rest of your life and do part or all of it very simply. And so that system is relax, Contraction whenever it's perceived. That's half of it. The other half is if you cannot relax contraction and you're stuck. I call that being entangled. It's like you've lost your temper, for example. You already, you already did and then you're in it. Or you just try and then you can't and you're frustrated. Then there is a list called the six paramitas. And uh, that list is, and they're Googleable but it's uh, generous actions, actions that make other beings not worry about being harmed by us, patience, following through, diligence, samadhi, and samadhi at its root, the way it's used there, or dhyana is basically to stop making yourself. Uh, don't add to the fabrication of a role of me or what I am right now. Don't think of yourself as anything. Just kind of be almost like if someone handed you a video game controller and you knew nothing about it and you just go, okay, what is my person? You know, like that's all you know about it. No one's told you anything. Just be that. And uh, then the six is wisdom. And wisdom is primarily developed by looking at causality. You look at when this happened, what happened? When this stops, what stops? You just kind of look at the world that way. And the system is, if you're caught, do one of those things. 
do something generous. Generous can just be, I see you. That's it. Or like someone's yammering on about something, generous can just be, let them. Like, that's it. Uh, patience is to not wait my turn, but to just, when it's my turn, respond without being queued up. Non-harm, the five precepts are non-harm, but their root is basically to just act or carry ourselves in a way just in this moment where we're pretty sure other beings don't feel like they have to watch out for us. They don't have to guard against us. They don't have to see if what we're saying is going to harm them. So it's kind of a way that uh, it's really wonderful to do that because you don't have to really think about that much. Uh, and then follow through or diligence is basically learning to, if you wish to do something, just start it. Like I said, start it and then see what's next. And uh, there's a kind of a joy. Most people know that joy when you manage to do something you wanted to do uh, or you hoped you would get done. Even if it's folding laundry or like answering an email or whatever. And a good way to do that in the modern day, if you like it, is use an app or something that has a checklist on it and then literally like do the thing and then write out the thing and put a check mark on it and then check it. And just be like, awesome. It's very simple. Uh, it builds that Pomoja joy and that kind of lubricates everything so it can soften easier. And then uh, Diana, like I said, is to look at who is doing this. It's to stop assuming I'm at the center of things, but to start examining where did that come from? When I itch my nose, did I decide to do that or did it just want to do that? And who wanted to do that? Where did it come from? Uh, so those are the first five. The six is just look at when this happens, why? When this stopped, why? And look at that with people. Look at it with thoughts. Look at it with the outside world. Look at it with how this Dharma Center is operating. It's happening. Why? How? It doesn't just... I used to say this, and people sometimes say this in songas I'm in. It's so neat you guys do this. What the heck does that mean? Like... We do it somehow. There's enough money and participation and volunteers to have it, but it's not like a machine that works and then you just show up. It doesn't work that way. It's actually just everyone coming together. Somehow it freaking happens. It's amazing. So the way we work with the paramitas, if we're entangled, imagine that is the hand of cards we've been dealt. So we look at our cards and we go, oh, man. It's just like frustrated, angry, bored. So that's your reality. And then all you do is you draw another card from your Paramita deck and you stick it in there with it. So you still have frustrated, angry, bored, and you also have generous act. And then you just do something nice, and that's it. You still are frustrated, angry, and bored, and that's okay. But you'll see it changes how you look at yourself. It changes how your actions happen. And um, the paramitas, as they develop, the first half of releasing gets easier and easier and easier. And the more that you do the first half, the more it develops the paramitas. Because this meditation I've been teaching is the six paramitas. So when we sit there and experience and we wait for realizing to happen, that's patience. And when we do this, instead of doing whatever we wanted to do today or whatever thing our preference is, we're being generous. We're being generous to others in how we'll treat them later, and we're being generous to ourselves in allowing ourselves to kind of learn something that might be healthy. Uh, when we do this, while you're sitting here, especially if I ring the bell and then I ring it again, in that period of time, you probably did absolutely nothing to harm another being or make them wonder whether you were going to. So you can kind of just have a free pass on that one. Cool. Uh, if you're supposed to wait until something shows up and then you're supposed to see if you can release it and you did that one time, diligence gets checked off. All through. Okay, I did it. I got one one iteration or more better at that. Uh, as you do it, 
you'll forget to make yourself. As you relax, you'll forget to make me at the center and you will fulfill the fifth pyramid, uh, dhyana or samadhi. And then several people have said, as I do this, sometimes insights come to me. I kind of realize something about how things are working. That's the sixth one. When this happened, why? When this stopped happening, why? So it's basically just a magic machine to polish all the paramitas at once. And paramita means perfection. It means these are things you should polish over and over and over. Ideally, so that one inherits consciousness when your body dies, gets it, and they're like that, and they polish it further. And then whatever gets it, gets it like that and polishes it further. And that process is how a Buddha is born. A Buddha is a being that inherits that when it's lifetime after lifetime after lifetime after lifetime has been polished and polished and polished. And then every so often, the world needs that. And so it comes into being. And if you don't want to think of it in that way, then we can say those lifetimes are thoughts. So if you want to think of it that way, you can be born as a Buddha. In this life, you can experience the Buddha mind by thought after thought after thought purifying how that thought happens by releasing and the mind learning how to have it more and more released until the mind has a released being. And so Buddha is the name of someone that taught this, but Buddha is also how that being functioned. And that is something innate in all of us if we polish it. It's there, but it's tarnished, or it has dirty laundry on it or something. So you just have to clean up until you realize what's there. You know, for the course of this, I'd been thinking about um, contraction in a sort of a muscular way, like that there's a physical contraction. And, and then in our last sit, I was realizing I was, I was um, trying to do release around sort of mental things or like fog feeling states or things that weren't I couldn't like have a mus like I would be searching for a muscular thing and I couldn't find it either because it's too subtle or because it's not there but, but then I was trying to think well can I release this this mental thing where I'm like like I'm wondering how long this is going to go on or I'm or I'm wondering if I'm doing it right or yeah. it didn't have a muscular analog and I'm wondering does that is it is it your advice that at this stage to really focus on the tangible physical thing? Or do you think it's it makes sense to um, move into the idea that, that these contractions can be, um, you know, mental or emotional kinds of knots? That's the six knots. So you work at this, the magic cloth that has six knots in it. Okay. You work with the body one. And when you know how to do that, you will know how to do it in your mind. Okay. And you arrived at it naturally. That's exactly okay. how it works. You'll also kind of weirdly know how to unentangle your hearing if that gets weird. Uh -huh. You'll just know how to, there's a tightness somewhere in that process that you can kind of, Okay. that's it. And that's why it's so cool. If I taught it from the mind first, it's hard to know how to release the mind right. sometimes. But the body, it's pretty obvious when we're tight, especially if you just tighten it up more and then soften it. And then you start to feel, oh, that's right, okay. And then at some point, you just intuit. So it's, kind of, it's kind of a way mind. in. Yeah, but it'd be hard to say exactly how yeah, you yeah. do it. Right. But it's related somehow. Yeah, it's somehow related. Yep, right. that's intuitive as well. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. All right, so get your legs situated. The key parts are stable, so you're not worried about falling over. Safe, so that you don't worry about harming your body. And comfortable, so that you're not constantly hurting unnecessarily. Then just forget about your legs and feel that balloon at the crown of your head the helium balloon on the string and let your body sway gently into upright. You'll know if you're upright because you won't have a collapsed chest. 
you don't have a collapsed diaphragm, you'll have some space to breathe, you'll have space for your heart to beat. And then contract and relax the hands, feel the pleasure in releasing them. Contract and relax the shoulders and feel the pleasure in releasing them. The back of the neck. the yawn, and then the forehead and the face. And feel that just gentle afterglow of a little bit more released body experience. And now, just like that snow globe or muddy water, we set it down and we let it begin to settle naturally at its own speed. Any tension unwinding naturally in there on its own. There's no end goal. We're not focusing on later, but just letting unwinding and settling kind of just happen.
warm our hands again. This is actually a massage of the channels or meridians. You follow roughly this pattern. You can squeeze where you want to squeeze. You can rub where you want to rub. And you can pat or kind of hit with soft fists where you want to. And just kind of let your body become like a pizza dough body. <laughs> So don't rush yourself in like being operable. Just kind of hang out and see, watch as things come online and go offline in your being. One method in Buddhism for realizing the emptiness of self is to watch the self rebuild when it's been gone or parts of it and watch the like blocks go back together and watch feelings and certain things come online and thought processes and then we can watch when we practice correctly them kind of quench and go offline okay so for a formal practice whatever that is we just did the last one of those, but hopefully it's come across that that's really a construct. You know, it's good to do formal practice because it's kind of like setting really good conditions to learn. But really this thing doesn't grow over or stays alive and builds by doing it all the time. It's like tying your shoes. You just tie your shoes a lot until you can just kind of thing like just you don't even think about it it just kind of comes out of you and so that's really the thing I'd like to encourage here um, let's see what we have here <clears throat> Uh, some people have asked or tend to ask, or can I read about this kind of thing? Is there someone teaching it? Uh, if there was, honestly, I would just be practicing with them. Um, I would rather do that than reinvent the wheel. But uh, there are lots of people that do part of it. And uh, you just have to be interested in that type of dharma. So, or dhamma in Pali, the, the word is dhamma. Um, so Ajahn Sumedho, who's a Thai forest monk, he's uh, older, he's from Seattle originally, and he lives in the UK now, but he puts talks up online, and those talks are really him just talking about it without language of how it's supposed to be. Uh, he uses a method where he kind of asks, what is this? And then he just kind of looks around. And so you'll hear him say that a lot. What is this? What is it that, you know, you'll say, and I'm, I've lost my temper and I'm so bored. And what is it that loses his temper and is so bored? And what is it that's talking to you right now? He'll just kind of say that. But as he's saying it, he's actually doing that. He's feeling that. What is this? Instead of being I am, he's being am I? Question mark. Am I doing this? Am I remembering this? 
why is this happening? The whole world. You can eventually leave the borders of your body and do that with everything. So he's really good, and uh, one of his quotes is that the real insights come not through concentrating on an object, but by letting go of all objects. And that's another way of saying what I've been teaching this whole weekend. Letting go of objects, letting go of distinction, letting go of discrimination, letting go of identification. Just letting go of whatever that contracting feeling is that those things grow out of, that's their root. And uh, letting go of I making, me making, my making, but not in a confusing way. We don't have to talk about it. You can just feel it to whatever degree you release and let things settle. It's a felt experience. Uh, another one is uh, Ajahn Brahm, and Ajahn Brahm is sort of a deceptive individual in that he sounds like maybe he's kind of a really jolly monk that waters things down or is kind of simple or something, but he's actually a really, really, really deep practitioner, and some of the deepest practitioners that I've worked with consider him their teacher. Um, and he does really funny stuff like uh, my mentor when she went to his monastery there were a bunch of teddy bears on some of the cushions but they were all like monks and nuns practicing there and so she goes like and she's a nun so she's, she said what is the teddy bear and then someone said well Ajahn Brahm jokes that he kind of looks like a bear because he's got kind of a fat belly and he sits in like he's got short limbs and he kind of fits sits in a jolly way, and she's like, yeah, but why does everyone have one? And he said, well, the other week he said, awareness is just bare attention, but he wanted people to remember it, so he just bought a bunch of teddy bears and has people hold them while they meditate, and they're like, why am I holding this thing? Bare attention. Right? So, <laughs> uh, he does stuff like that. It's like really outside the box, and it's funny, but honestly, he's amazing. Um, I recommend his Dharma Talks. He's on YouTube, too. Uh, he also, if this is of interest to you, he is one of the most supportive and active monastics in the world that I know of in helping women become monastics and uh, gay, queer, trans, any individuals that kind of don't fit in the box of what monasticism, because monasticism historically has like male and female monastics, male and female lay people. And he is... Uh, without any real support and sometimes with quite a bit of opposition where people have said there's no real place for that he just totally helps people and says come here and I'll help you do that you know, uh, he wants people to be able to practice Dhamma and I think that's really awesome to just support someone who uh, is doing a really good thing for humanity uh, even though that it might burn bridges for him with uh, some of the formal teachers he's had and stuff. That doesn't mean that uh, the Buddhist community is against that kind of thing. It just means parts of the Buddhist community are really into keeping rules. And some of the rules, there's not, the language is like a long time ago and it's a dead language and it's translated into English and when they try to interpret it, some people like interpret it very strictly one way and some people interpret it another way and it's just kind of like that. So I think he's helping us evolve uh, into a better place. Because once it's there, it'll just be another thing that, another way to do it. And uh, actually, it kind of is already there, but it just isn't all over. So he's a great person. Um, there's a Buddhist you can find two books on named Banke. He lived in Japan in like the 1600s. And he became the lineage inheritor at his time of Rinzai Zen. And uh, he asked that no one ever record or write down in any way anything that he taught. And the reason we have those books is because his students didn't listen to them. And they uh, they kept notes anyways and eventually collected them together. And he was a really outside the box teacher. Uh, he practiced really hard, really traditionally. So hard that he 
got bed sores or wore holes in his buttocks. Like he practiced a crazy hard amount. He got himself so expended with energy that he got deathly ill. And his awakening experience was when he thought he was about to die, he hacked up this black thing and spit it and it hit the wall and he watched it get on the wall and he was awakened. Um, which is already kind of funny, but um, he deeply, very deeply awakened. And um, his first realization that he kind of talked about, maybe not the first one, but he talked about that no religion owns this. Uh, and he, he would say, I'm not going to talk to you from the Buddhist scriptures. I'm not going to say Buddha. I'm not going to say Dharma. I'm not going to use those words. I'm just going to tell you how to wake up. And so there, there are two books of his teachings. And his way he talked about it, I talk about it as not holding contraction, right? And letting things settle his way, uh, which is really good language, but you've got to open your mind to it, is to not be born. And to not be born means to not be born as an identity. And so if you think of yourself in any way, ugly, beautiful, a DJ, a teacher, <laughs> a good dancer, man, woman, old, young, whatever it is, that's being born. Every time we do that, we're born. And when we're born, we're subject to death, which means someone can challenge that or we can forget to make it and, it, and then we suffer a death in that moment and then we have to be born again. And he recommended just don't be born, which in his language was fu shou, and he would just say fu shou, don't be born, don't be born. And uh, one of my favorite teachings of his is a woman comes to him back then and says, you know, it's so hard for a woman to awakening. Is it worth doing? And he says, when do you have to become a, wo a woman? Uh, and that doesn't mean her experience as a female, but it means the idea that I can be categorized instead of just being what, what you are. Because the nature of mind has no gender. The nature of mind has no needs. It's already purified. It's already happy. It's there. We just have to uncover it has no age. Uh, it's deathless, birthless, uh, but it, I don't want to use a bunch of words, it's, it's talking about swimming, but you should touch it. That's what we've been trying to do. Um, Zhuangzi is a Taoist. Uh, Zhuangzi wrote back around the time that Lao Tzu was around, a little bit later. And Can you spell it? Yeah, the spelling is either Z H U A N G Z I. That's one way of saying it. Or Chung C H U N G T Z U. Those are the two ways to say. But there's not a lot of other Taoism things that sound like that. So if you even get close, you'll probably find it. How do you spell like the last guy? So Zendai. Uh, Banke. B A N K E I. And Zhuangzi, uh, Lao Tzu left us, if we read just the Tao Te Ching is from Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu left a very, like, the Tao Te Ching is almost impossible to translate well. Um, I have and recommend, there's a, a translation of it by Red Pine, and Red Pine knows, like, nine different ways you could translate every character, and so he'll kind of, like, he translates it, then he'll give like seven different or nine different or several different commentaries on like how different people read this throughout history. And then he'll say why he did it the way he did it. And um, I don't have time to really go into it or show you, but old Chinese stuff was genius. And also it's really important to understand how it worked to see why it doesn't work well in English. And that's uh, when I, a poem was written in classical, like old Chinese, the character, each character might have nine or 12 different meanings. And then when they're next to each other, they contextualize. But there isn't ever a place where the author tells you the context they wrote it in. And so it leaves this like word cloud that you can kind of, however you are coming at it, you can say, I think it meant this. And that's 
what poetry kind of was then. And the uh, Tao Te Ching is written that way. So it's crazy when you get into something that's 20 characters long or something, what that could actually mean. It could, I mean, if it was a song, it could be like a country song or a rap song or like wordless or who knows, right? Uh, so anyways, in there he talks about, can you be soft like a baby? And that's, uh, that's another pointer to this kind of thing. This is uh, the root practice in Taoism of Taoist cultivation. Back then was called uh, Zou Wang. And Zou Wang means to sit and forget everything. But forgetting doesn't mean not knowing what's going on. It means as soon as you get caught, forget about it. As soon as you get caught, forget about it. And that is exactly what I was teaching. As soon as there's contraction, forget about it. As soon as you get distracted, forget about it. And when we forget all the stuff that catches us, we forget to make the problems. We forget to make us. And um, it's a very natural way to just arrive at something that's really profound. So uh, Zhuangzi and Lao Tzu are both good. And then there's a Korean nun named Dai Hung. Uh, Sunim. Her writings will probably be too radical for most Western people, uh, but she is teaching it, and she passed away in 2012. Her name is D-A-E-H-A-E-N-G, Daihan. Uh, and Sunim means like venerable or teacher. Uh, but she basically just said, whatever it is that's breathing you and walks and like makes you think ideas and stuff, it's been doing that for billions of years and bodies pop up in it and then die. And it knows how to do it. Why don't you just let it do stuff? That's what she taught. And then she said, it uses your senses, so be aware of what's going on and then we'll make good decisions. And when you need to figure something out, just ask it, say, hey, what should I do? Please, and don't think of it as separate from you. Just say, what should I do? And then wait, and you'll do something. And. Uh, that's what I mean. It's very radical, but it's, to me, like, I practiced for 30 years with nothing like that confirmed. And when I read that, I was like, oh, my God, I wish I heard this 30 years ago. Like, because going against the current of how life should work to get there takes a long time. And she was just telling people, yeah, no, that's how you should do stuff. That's how you should have, you know, treat your partner and work and stuff. And there are YouTube videos of her talking with uh, transcription into, well, I don't know if it's trans translation into English, uh, subtitles that you can watch or you can read her books. But that's the essence of her teaching. Uh, so Buddha nature or the Tao or the Tathagata Garbha or the Namanakaya, the Dharmakaya, uh, true nature, your face before you were born, lots of other terms for it. Uh, that is not uh, some abstract idea. It's actually a thing that is operating everything. It's what makes the wind blow, what makes the weather. It's what makes every single one of us operate and die. It's the laws of nature. And it's one thing. It's not even one thing. It's just everything. And it's possible to be in harmony with that, which is what old Taoism is. Old Taoism is the study of harmony with the laws of nature. But what that means is way crazier than what we might think it means. And it's possible to let it drive you somewhere or decide what you're going to say next. Um, and it doesn't have a selfish agenda. And it knows this part of it. Jason doesn't know what every other part of it is doing. But it is in everything, using all of those senses. And so if we ask to harmonize with it, it harmonizes with everything. And if you don't believe me, you should just try it and find out. Uh, like I said, try it with little things first and let it learn and see what happens. It's pretty amazing. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. So, um... This weekend, I sent my family away because I had a ton of stuff to do, but then I found out about this retreat. So um, I've kind of like, I've, 
I listened to when you've been talking and I sat in the beginning, but the rest of the time I've just had my headphones on with you in my pocket and been like uh, doing the to, my to-do list. And so yesterday at the end of the day, when everybody was like sharing what appeared to be profound shit that was happening to them, like I was really bummed <laughs> that I did, wasn't doing it right or, or whatever. But then I went on a walk in the woods this morning and my ability to be mindful or my realizing happened so much more than it normally would on a walk. And so, um, and so, and then I realized too, that that feeling that I had last night, like, even though I thought I was sitting with it, I wasn't really sitting with it. Like I, I was pissed. So, um, I don't know that you invite people to a retreat while you're folding laundry. And at one point you started the Qigong thing and I was in CVS because like my, you know, that was taking too long anyway. So, but it was um, a very interesting <laughs> weekend. And so it, so I, I've been able to see that it's possible to do this, you know, so often I have a mom retreat and I end up like binging modern family or something. So now the practice is how can I do this when other humans are in my house? Because I have not yeah. had that experience yet. <laughs> I have not. Yeah, had just <laughs> be forgiving of yourself and try it. Try it in little, little interactions and then let the rest of it be how it always is and just kind of see if it's better or worse. And uh, I had a, a woman come on retreat with me that had real severe back pain and she basically could not sit for more than a couple of minutes. So she asked, when you give a Dharma talk, can I just kind of stand in the back and then as soon as it hurts too much, can I just go outside? And I said, sure. And so I kind of taught her what to do. And she walked for like five days. That's all she did all day. She walked and then she laid down and then she'd walk around the wood, not meditation walk, just like walked in the woods and then laid down and ate lunch and then laid down and then walked. And she had a very, very deep practice. And uh, I want that to be clear that sitting is just setting a type of condition that might help us learn it. But it's really releasing tension while blank. You can release tension while you do laundry. You can release tension while you have an interaction. You can release tension when the interaction goes bad and you're frustrated, then release tension while you're frustrated. And if you do that, you can't miss. It's like a pendulum. It may swing way out of what you want, but it eventually goes like that. And that's, you can't miss it. It will align. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, I wanted to thank you and all the other participants for this weekend. It was a really great retreat. And um, especially uh, the questions that other people have asked and that you've answered have been really helpful. Um, someone asked about, they noticed that like they started just constantly looking for tension. And of course, they always found it. And that definitely happened to me, like in the sit that that person had that experience. <laughs> and um, and then later on, and the last, all the sits this afternoon, I, um, it, it was, it was very interesting because it felt like I just, I was just like, you know, I'm not even going to try to relax tension anymore. I'm just going to watch because um, I'm, tr I'm trying too hard when I'm relaxing. And then um, it felt flowy uh, in a way that it, I think it hasn't very frequently before. And the flow was broken up by like, is this flow? Uh, yeah. Like me asking myself. And um, it, it did feel like I was watching myself. I like think thoughts were happening where I was like oh that's something that I usually think but it didn't feel like it was me thinking it and I was yeah. like I'm just not gonna like deal with that I'm like and then a, a lot you know you talked about micro adjustments and then it didn't feel like I was micro adjusting my body so much anymore I was but like something was micro adjusting the tension in my mind um and then sometimes you know it would like the the hardening would last for longer and sometimes it was like very like blippy and it was just like hard soft hard soft but um yeah it was it was helpful because I experienced a lot of doubt and I think I've gotten to this place and my thought was similar to what someone else had asked like is am I too dull right now like is this a not a good place to be and um I think this weekend helped me helped reassure me 
Good. I'd say please leave notes for yourself of what you just said. And then look at that again. When you feel lost later or at home or on a retreat or whatever, just read what you just said to yourself. And it will give you some confidence. And that, that's really good practice. That's how it works. Uh, that, that thing, whatever you want to call it, it experiments and it tries things. And then it turns things on and off and flips switches until it knows how it works. And so, but you have to let it. And some of us get there by softening. And some of us get soft by trying to soften and getting so pissed off by it that you get so hard that you get exhausted and then you are soft. <laughs> and that both ways are the same thing. Uh, and there's not a way for me to make one or the other happen. I can just offer the tools that will do either. And then it's a process of elimination and you find your way to that. So that sounds really uh, like how it is. Thank you. I also, uh, I don't usually give a lot of Dharma talks and that's because uh, Dharma, means nature. Dharma means the Tao. Dharma means the laws of what is. Buddha Dharma means the laws of what is that Buddha focused on. And so I drop some Dharma concepts and then our group sharing is the Dharma talk. You hear another person's mind, how it works. That's your Dharma talk. You start to see that's happened to me or that didn't happen to me or weird. I wonder if that's ever going to happen to me or whatever. But that way, we all share reality, a much more nuanced reality and varied reality than our own experience. Uh, so thank you for letting me do that. Yeah, I, I have a question about, so I did all of the sits with my eyes closed, but I'm curious, I guess, what your thoughts are on when you are doing, like, if you were to do it eyes open, I feel like something that I've struggled with, with like open awareness meditation is like, if I'll find myself like focusing on something in my visual field. Yeah. And then when I'm like releasing, when I'm like deconstrict, constricting, I don't know what to go back yeah. to. Um, like whether I just like unfocus my, my vision. So I'm curious, like what, what does that look like when you're having your eyes open? Uh, that's a great question. I, I'm a huge advocate of eyes open if you're ready for it. And everybody's ready for it, but you not, might not like it. <laughs> so when you're ready for it and you like it enough or you're willing to like learn it enough, uh, your eye, your visual field will actually change slightly before you have a thought or a contraction. And uh, if you've released that, you won't even have the other stuff. It's kind of trippy. You start to realize your eyes change and then you have a thought and um, it's weird. But uh, my ophthalmologist, my dad was an ophthalmologist too, but he never said this, but my ophthalmologist coincidentally is really into eyes. And uh, he said he thinks that might be because the eyes grow the most directly out of the central nervous system and that the behavior of the eyes might be sort of entrained with the behavior of the brain. Uh, so anyways, in answering your question, the first thing is, it's really hard to do in a room for most people at first. Look at a whole tree or a whole group of trees. You can't really look at one part of it to take it in. And so the thing you have to do is what you need to know how to do. You kind of just let it, or fireflies at night if you're smaller, where there are fireflies, you'll see them. Or shooting stars, how to watch for a shooting star or lightning. You don't look like this. You have to kind of open up and then it'll go and like, happen in your vision. That thing you're doing with your eyes is what you do with all of your senses. Um, to do it at home, one of the most genius pieces of technology uh, comes from Bodhidharma and that's sit facing right in front of a wall, like this close. And then you'll get bored of looking at the texture eventually and you'll just kind of let your eyes spread out. Um, if you want to know how to do it as an exercise, you take both your fingers like this, you wiggle them so you can see them, and then pull your arms out to the side and keep going until you can't see the wiggling. And now bring them back so you can see it at the very edge of your periphery and then watch both your fingers at the same time and relax everything in between them. 
and when that relaxes, you'll still see your fingers, but you're not focusing anywhere, then just put your hands down. And then if you start focusing, just do that again. Open. You kind of, it's like in the old cartoons, they try to close it and then the thing would like pull it open. You just pull it open and then you like let it go and it'll pop open. Okay? Yep. All right, I think that's our time. I'm so grateful for everyone. I think